Secretary, are there any apologies? Uh, yes, Mr. Excellent. We, we've, we've got a sound check there. Excellent. We can, we can see you and we can hear you. Uh, I declare open this round table hearing of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs on the subject of fixed four year parliamentary terms here in Canberra. Australia's constitution provides that the term of the House of Representatives is no longer than three years from the first meeting of the House. Since Federation, the average length of parliaments has been about two and a half years. This is shorter than lower house terms in many other democratic systems around the world. Here in Australia, all states and territories except Queensland have moved to four-year terms and Queensland will move to fixed four-year terms from next year. There has long been discussion about the merits of adopting both fixed terms and four-year terms for the House of Representatives. The latter was put to the Australian people unsuccessfully at a referendum in 1988. It has been argued that four-year terms would give more room for governments to focus on longer-term outcomes and that fixed terms would provide for greater stability and certainty in the political cycle. On the other hand, there are questions about how four-year terms in the House would work with the current arrangements in the Senate and how fixed terms would work when governments lose the confidence of the House or when the House and the Senate disagree. Beyond this, changing the term of the House would require an alteration to the Constitution to be approved at a referendum, which, as we know, uh, are notoriously difficult in Australia. To discuss these issues here today, the committee is pleased to welcome a panel of distinguished constitutional experts. The committee is also keen to involve the community in the discussion. The House of Representatives uh, Twitter account will be posting updates. Anyone with a question is welcome to post in a tweet or comment, making sure you tag at about the House and the committee will consider putting these questions to the panel during the hearing. Indeed, we have received some tweets already. In accordance with the committee's resolution of the 23rd of July 2019, this roundtable is being broadcast on the Parliament's website and the proof and official transcripts of proceedings will be published on the website. Those present here today are advised that filming and recording are permitted during the hearing. I remind members of the media who may be present or listening on the web of the need to fairly and accurately report the proceedings of the committee. I now welcome our panel of witnesses to give evidence today. For the Hansard record, would you please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear before the committee from my left, your right. Uh, I am Malcolm McCarris and I am appearing in a private capacity. Thank you. I am a, an honorary fellow of Australian Catholic University, but I'm not appearing for that reason. Thank you, uh, Mr McCarris. Cheryl Saunders, I'm appearing uh, as a member of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies at Melbourne Law School. Thank you, Professor Saunders. Uh, Gabrielle Appleby, and I'm a member of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law at the University of New South Wales. Thanks, Professor Appleby. And uh, George Williams, I'm Dean of Law at the University of New South Wales. I'm appearing in a private capacity. Thanks, Professor Williams. And last but by no means least, um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and to me with bronchitis, so um, difficult to talk a bit here, uh, um, from the University of Sydney, um, but appearing in a private capacity. Uh, well, don't take this personally, uh, Professor Toomey, but I'm pleased that you're there and we're here. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, I invite each of our witnesses to make a brief opening statement of up to five or six minutes each. Uh, before we proceed to discussion. My intention is to uh, essentially uh, break this morning up into two sessions. The first session will be arguments for uh, and against uh, uh, four-year terms after we hear from, your, uh, you, from you about your opening statements. And then we'll break for a short morning tea. That's the plan anyway, unless uh, we run behind time. 
um, and uh, we'll then basically have a discussion about if we were to introduce fixed four-year terms, how would we best go about it? Does anybody have any questions? All right. So uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Professor McCarris to kick, kick us off and uh, just reminding you all that uh, if you can keep your opening statements to between five and six minutes in duration. Okay, well, I begin by correcting you. I am Mr. McCarris. I'm Mr. McCarris. I'm, I'm the sorry. only person on the panel who is not a professor of constitutional law, for what that's worth. Okay, now, what are, what are my views? Well, I begin by saying I chance to be the only member of the panel who's put in a submission. That's pure chance that that should happen. About 15 years ago, I posted on the website of Old Parliament House, of which I'm a volunteer guide, an article titled Early General Elections for Australia's House Representatives, in which I put all the facts and figures about it. And I decided quite recently to update this article so when this voice came through inviting me, I said, well, I've, I've been wondering what to do with this article. Would you like to put it on your website? And the answer was, yes, yes, we encourage that. So having put it on the website, I then thought, oh, look, that just deals with the history of 110 years of the Parliament of Commonwealth of Australia. Why don't I write another article dealing with the current situation? So early general elections for the House of Representatives. Look, all it sets out is all the details, every date you need to know, every length of the parliamentary term, every length of the campaign, every detail about double dissolutions and all that sort of thing. But it has an underlying tone, which is how excellent the current arrangements are. They are excellent arrangements, and all the criticisms of them are false in my view. So I'll come to that, back to that later on. Now, the second article is titled No Eight-Year Terms for the House of Unrepresentative Swill. So what I do in this article is firstly, I do the following things. Firstly, I demonstrate that the Senate is unrepresentative swill. Then I say the Australian people have never indicated in any poll that they want to see eight-year terms for the House of Unrepresentative Swill. So rule that out altogether, just dismiss that altogether. Don't even spend much time on the eight-year terms for senators. Concentrate instead on the alternative idea, which is to have every election fixed at each four years terms with the entire 12 senators elected as though it were a double dissolution in which you don't need to allocate the six and three year terms following it. That's the alternative proposal. I have considered that seriously. But I have come to the view that that is not a good idea. And I explain why it's not a good idea in this article. So basically, that's my position. Now, apropos of the arguments for doing this change, oh, we, they we. are based on the criticisms as follows. They criticise the Prime Minister for abusing his power to name the election date. I think that criticism is quite false. The Prime Minister has never abused his power, or her power for that matter. Uh, there have always been good reasons why there's been a dissolution, and they are described in this article. So that's the first criticism I object to, I dismiss. I dismiss the proposition that the parliamentary term is typically one year implementing a program, the middle year doing governing and the last year campaigning. I think that it's not correct at all, as the present parliament shows. The present parliament indicates what is mostly the case. The first year of a parliamentary term is simply an existing government governing with not much of a legislative program. So I dismiss that completely. Uh, so you'll see my position from all of this. Now, on the question of having a double dissolution, in effect, every election for 12 senators, well, my argument basically is this. I haven't presented in this, but I'm presenting it in a book that I've currently, that I've written without a, no publisher yet, but I'm hopeful it'll be published within a couple of years. My proposition is this. The size of the parliament should be increased. <laughs> 
there should be 88 senators in lieu of the present 76, and that would increase the size of the House of Representatives from 151 to a number like 173, 174, or 175. And South Australia would get two more seats, by the way. And New South Wales would get eight more seats and so forth. Now, that would mean half Senate elections would be for seven senators, which would be a sensible number to elect at a half Senate election. Six is not a sensible number to elect. And all of this should be done by a reform of the Senate voting system in which the parliament decides by way of a change to give the Australian people a decent Senate voting system, which I will explain in this book. But I won't explain it now because my time has expired. All right. Thank you very much, Mr McCarris. Uh, Professor Saunders. Mr Chairman, I was worried as I was thinking about the session whether <clears throat> we might all go over very similar ground. So um, rather than uh, running that risk, can I just sketch the framework that I've been using for myself to think about these issues and then we can um, follow up any particular issues uh, during the, the rest of the morning. Uh, so I begin by um, distinguishing between questions of technical design and questions of principle. In other words, should uh, is, is the idea of moving to four-year terms a good idea? And indeed, that's the way the committee's thinking about it, as I understand uh, the way you're setting up uh, this morning's uh, program. Uh, in, in terms of technical issues, I think we can distinguish between uh, flexible four-year terms and fixed four-year terms. Uh, there is obviously a question about which of those uh, is, is preferable. I think it would be pretty hard not to pursue fixed four-year terms if you're thinking about moving to four-year terms, but the reasons for that are something that we can uh, explore a bit further in question time. Uh, in terms of design, um, either flexible or fixed four-year terms raise the questions of what to do about Senate terms. Um, there are three broad options, none of them terribly satisfactory. One is to leave them as they are, which is probably the least satisfactory because it would be very hard to synchronise elections. Another is to move them to four-year terms uh, also, uh, which I think is the um, proposal that roughly was rejected in 1988, um, but is... It was a fixable to four-year terms. Yeah, but mm. is obviously uh, mm. an option. Uh, and the other is to extend them to eight-year terms. And either of those will be controversial in their own way. Um, the four-year term mm. proposal also, as uh, Malcolm noted, uh, removes the rotation of the Senate. Um, fixed four-year terms then raise some additional design questions. Uh, some of them revolve around the needs of responsible government. Uh, what exceptions would you have uh, to the fixed term in order to um, maintain the rule that uh, uh, the government must have the confidence of the House of Representatives. Um, there's a whole range of technical issues that are raised by that question, many of them usefully uh, illuminated by the various different models that you now find in state constitutions. And I think the state constitutions are a very useful resource to point the committee to the sorts of things uh, that need to be considered, uh, like, for example, how do you identify no confidence are there other events such as rejection of supply that should trigger an early dissolution? Uh, whether the fixed election date is movable depending on other circumstances like uh, natural disasters? Uh, how to return to fixed terms after an early dissolution? Uh, and whether there's any residual discretion uh, in the Governor General coupled with the Prime Minister uh, to dissolve the House early. So the, the, the states deal with those issues differently and they're, they're quite an interesting um, set of uh, options for the, for the committee uh, to look at. Um, then in addition for um, fixed terms, you need to consider uh, what to do about the Senate. One question is whether uh, to retain the um, the double dissolution procedure in section 57, uh, if it's retained, which of course is the course of least resistance, uh, then that's another exception uh, to the fixed term and it would be an exception to some extent within the control of a prime minister who has uh, uh, stockpiled trigger double dissolution bills, which would be an issue. Um, again, the state constitution show different ways of dealing with deadlocks uh, with other houses. The other issue raised by the Senate, uh, the Senate's powers in connection with fixed terms, 
is the question of the rejection of supply. Uh, what, if anything, uh, how is this, uh, it, would a fixed term uh, four year uh, model deal with the, the, no doubt, theoretical possibility, but nevertheless possibility uh, that the Senate could reject supply? Uh, if you deal with that explicitly, you will end up resolving the argument that began in 1975 one way or the other. The only way of not dealing with it explicitly is to uh, just dodge it uh, by um, having some sort of residual discretion in the Governor-General to dissolve in other circumstances, which would also be controversial uh, in some ways. So all of those issues are technical design questions, which we can talk about. Uh, then there's the questions of principle, uh, which Malcolm has touched upon. Um, the main question of principle in favour of um, four-year terms always is that uh, governments need a longer period of time during which they're not uh, campaigning or preparing for the next election, uh, that there are complex issues uh, that uh, require a longer period of time, that in comparative terms uh, the House of Representatives has a relatively short term. Um, there are sort of other places that also have three-year terms, including New Zealand, but, but nevertheless that comparative argument is quite often used. The argument in principle against four-year terms, I think, is that uh, in the Australian constitutional system, uh, fairly regular elections is an important part of the checks and balances <clears throat> in a country that otherwise has relatively few checks and balances. Uh, no Bill of Rights, and we're having a national debate on that at the moment as, uh, um, as the prosecutions of journalists proceed. Um, a fairly centralised federal system, um, a party system uh, in which party discipline is very tight, reducing the, uh, the check that the uh, parliament uh, plays on, on the executive branch. So I think um, uh, that in, in order to really think about the principle of four-year terms, we need to think about the role that elections play uh, within our constitutional system. Uh, and if we were to move to longer terms, I think the committee would also need to start thinking in terms of what other checks and balances could we think of that might operate during that period uh, that would A, compensate and B, persuade the electorate to vote in favour of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Saunders. Uh, we might go to you, Professor Toomey. Well, greetings um, <laughs> from Sydney. Um, some time ago, I wrote a paper for, um, indeed it was another country, about fixed four-year terms in Australia, um, and in that I put together a list of the arguments for and against, so I might just go through those. Um, so the arguments in favour were fewer elections, reducing the cost to the public, both in running elections as well as public funding for political parties, the need for campaign donations and the like. Um, secondly, the elimination of speculation about an early election being called and the resulting reduction of public and governmental disruption. Uh, fairness to all political parties as the election date is known in advance by all and therefore they can all plan and budget accordingly. Uh, better economic planning and longer term focus and more time for governments to govern rather than being on an electoral footing all the time. Um, including space to make unpopular decisions um, where they're necessary to do so for reasons of good government. Um, arguments against fixed four-year terms uh, include that there, there are therefore fewer opportunities for the people to hold their representatives to account in elections, uh, the inability to remove a government that has lost the support of the people as long as it retains support in the lower house, um, having said that, a government that's on the skids anyway is unlikely to call its election early, but um, nonetheless, um, four-year terms would extend the period in which it can govern. Uh, the risk of unstable and ineffectual government if a minority government is constantly being defeated by independents or small parties, but they do not support a motion of no confidence so there can be no election or change of government. Um, I note that one's a little bit prophetic um, uh, because it seems to show what's been happening recently in the United Kingdom um, during the period where the House was um, opposed to an election, but at the same time the government was being constantly defeated. Uh, lack of flexibility in the election date, which can be problematic in a, in a crisis. And finally, loss of the capacity of a government to go to the polls on an issue of major importance 
to ascertain public support. Uh, that one also has arisen in the United Kingdom quite quickly um, uh, in relation to Brexit. Um, there was a, an argument uh, that uh, the government needed to be able to call an election to resolve deadlock in relation to Brexit, and it was unable to do so um, unless it could um, convince um, the opposition to support an election uh, motion or indeed uh, a vote of no confidence in it. Um, now, eventually, we did finally get that resolution. Um, following on from those points, the one thing I will say, I've been in the United Kingdom recently and have, um, in fact, given evidence to a UK parliamentary committee on the prorogation issues and um, the like. And one of the things I mentioned to it was that its Fixed Term Parliament Act was extremely badly drafted. Uh, so what they've been going through recently has been a consequence of that act uh, being enacted as a uh, reaction to a uh, coalition government where uh, one party was concerned that the other party was going to uh, drop it and go to an election whenever it was convenient to do so, and the Fixed Term Parliament Act was really the consequence and a reflection of that. Uh, it was not well drafted. It's got all sorts of horrible flaws in it. Uh, one of the flaws is uh, the fact that it uh, doesn't prevent um, the Prime Minister from seeking the prorogation of Parliament in the 14 days after a vote of no confidence. Uh, in comparison, the New South Wales legislation does expressly prevent prorogation in those circumstances. Uh, and indeed, I pointed that out to a UK parliamentary committee when they, their bill was being drafted and nobody did anything about it. But now they're thinking, well, maybe they should have. Uh, there are other horrible problems with that bill. Another one is the fact that the Prime Minister is the one who gets to decide when the election is actually held. Uh, that's not really a great idea if the Parliament, if the Prime Minister could say, right, well, we'll have an election, but in two years' time. Uh, so there are all sorts of drafting flaws um, and conceptual flaws that um, were highlighted in that UK legislation. So the one thing I would um, strongly say to the committee is that um, if you go down this route, you need to actually think it through clearly and not do it for just one political reason. You actually need to think through what the consequences of it are, how it interacts with other constitutional conventions, how it might um, operate in sort of crisis situations uh, and those sorts of things. It's the sort of thing that needs to be very, very carefully thought through. Um, the one advantage we have in Australia is that we have now almost all states having term parliaments. Uh, and so we have a plethora of legislation that deals with it, uh, which you can look at and compare and choose the be best bits from and reject the bad bits because, yes, there are some drafting flaws in those state provisions as well. Um, I think I'll leave it there for the moment. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Toomey. Uh, Professor Appleby. Thank you, and thank you, Chair, and the committee for this invitation to join um, the Constitutional Roundtable today um, at, and the opportunity to discuss with the committee an issue of constitutional um, significance. It's been uh, a couple of years now since a roundtable like this has been held, and I think it's really important to have these public discussions um, around these issues um, uh, uh, because uh, I think that the lack of public discussion around constitutional reform can exacerbate that general lack of education in the community around the constitutional which can lead to an apathy um, uh, around uh, not just uh, constitutional education but also constitutional um, reform. And it can contribute to a sense in the community but also politically that constitutional reform is uh, either not necessary or not achievable in our political um, system. So my, my opening statements, I'm not going to repeat um, the uh, arguments um, of principle um, and some of the, the technical issues that arise in relation to the four-year term proposal because I think they've been very well covered by uh, the other, um, uh, my uh, esteemed um, colleagues on the panel as well uh, already. Um, I would say though that um, Whilst the proposal of the four-year terms raises a whole myriad of issues, um, some of them around four-year terms in the House of Reps, some of them consequential in relation to Senate terms, for example, um, some of them uh, additional or even um, alternatives, such as the idea of fixed uh, versus flexible terms, 
I would also um, like to uh, raise uh, the, the issue around um, a larger question around the state of the referendum process in Australia. Um, because if we're having a discussion about a potential constitutional reform proposal um, uh, uh, around four year terms, I think that has to be part of the discussion, not just a discussion about the politics of whether this particular proposal would be well received in the public and meet the requirements of the referendum proposal but what our current process and machinery is for, um, uh, for a referendum, because there hasn't been uh, significant reform of that machinery uh, process for um, a long period. Um, and uh, I think that there are particular questions um, around how referendums are, how public education campaigns are um, <coughs> conducted around referendums. Um, at the moment, we have the official yes, no pamphlet, which is produced um, out of the parliamentary process. Um, and uh, there have been uh, suggestions that that needs to be supplemented by uh, a um, independent uh, uh, objective public education campaign, um, and that the yes, no campaigns themselves should be subject to a, a further level of scrutiny in terms of um, the, the claims that are made in those campaigns. So I think there's some real questions around the public education, uh, uh, cam um, the public education process in the current machinery provisions legislation. Um, there's also questions around uh, financing, both in terms of government's ability to spend on, uh, uh, on a referendum. Um, at the moment, it's uh, um, prohibited, other than the yes, no campaign that's set out in the machinery provisions legislation. Um, now, that's uh, often been changed for individual referendums, and we saw that in the 1999 Republic referendum. But I think there's a question about whether that actually needs to be changed for any future referendum, um, and whether uh, there should be uh, uh, greater government spending allowed to ensure um, uh, this uh, more independent uh, public education campaign can take place, um, albeit of course not without with restrictions uh, and, 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 and appropriate limitations. Um, and then of course there's the question around uh, funding of uh, referendum campaigns and political donations and there's currently no uh, equivalent financial um, regulation of, the, of referendums um, that uh, we, uh, um, in, in that respect. Uh, so look, my opening statement is just to put those bigger issues on the table and I hope that perhaps in the session after the morning tea break we'll be able to discuss some of those questions of process. Um, I also think as part of that discussion, um, if we're looking at a particular constitutional reform, it needs to be part of a larger discussion around constitutional reform in Australia. Um, of course, we have a number of reform uh, proposals that have been discussed um, uh, in the last few years. Um, uh, we have uh, the question around uh, the uh, meaningful recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the constitution. We have the question around uh, potential republic um, uh, referendum. We have the question around section 44 reform um, and uh, qualifications of parliamentarians as well. And I think uh, a discussion around uh, four-year term potential reform should be placed in that context of where does this come as a constitutional reform priority um, and how that may have political consequences for the success of those reforms. Thank you. Well, you've well and truly kicked the door open there. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Williams. Yes, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I also want to start with some broader context because, of course, when we're talking about constitutional reform, uh, this parliament has a special responsibility. It is the only body that can initiate constitutional reform. We don't have a citizens initiated referenda in Australia. The states can't do so. So it is the House and the Senate. And as someone who's worked across this area for some decades, um, I've come to the view that this parliament is not properly discharging its responsibility in this area. It has simply dropped the ball in ensuring that matters come forward for public discussion and ensuring that matters are put to referendum. And I think it's particularly because this parliament has not sufficiently engaged with these issues that uh, we are now at such a low ebb when it comes to constitutional reform in Australia. And the statistics bear that out quite starkly. Of course, we've had 44 referendums, eight have succeeded, but no referendum has succeeded since 1977. So it's 42 years since this parliament put any proposal to the Australian community that they were minded to support. And uh, that means for roughly a third of the life of this nation, uh, we simply have not had any success in this area. And that says Parliament has not discharged that responsibility of putting proposals to the people that they think ought to be supported. 
And of course, this period of 42 years coincides with an ageing constitution when arguably reform is more needed than ever. And I'm talking not just about uh, some more popular issues, but indeed simply the mechanics of the document, fixed four-year terms, but also dealing with their federal structure, which is often in a diabolical shape when it comes to driving economic, economic growth, when it comes to actually delivering on the prosperity that the community needs from its constitutional structure. We also see, I think, that problem of fulfilling the responsibility when it comes to the number of referendums. Uh, if you look at the record, on average, we put a referendum about every two and a half to three years, but no referendum has been put on any topic since 1999. Uh, in fact, until 1999, there was no decade in our history that had not had at least one referendum. But we didn't have any uh, from 2000 to 2010. We've had none in this current decade. And so we look at having two full decades without a single referendum being put. And that again says that Parliament is not discharging its obligation to put referendums to the people in areas that uh, need to be put. So it's in that context that I certainly welcome this discussion today. And I'd also say it must be part of a broader discussion, as my colleagues have adverted to. Uh, we don't have the machinery within Parliament or elsewhere to properly analyse these issues. I think we need a constitutional commission that will engage in a non-partisan way with the community to educate, to identify proposals, to report to Parliament, and to enable Parliament to then have robust debates about these issues in a considered way that builds momentum towards referendums. We need more regular conventions of the community to discuss those proposals. I'd also say that we're now overdue for a holistic review of the Constitution. These have occurred every 30 years since Federation. 1929, uh, we had a Royal Commission. 1959, we had a Joint Select Committee of Parliament. 1988, we had a Constitutional Commission. So the next report is due in 2018, if we follow that pattern, but we see nothing on the public record that would give us that 30-year review of the Constitution that we have had regularly up until this point. So I think that, again, is an area in dire need. So my view when I come to Section 44 is very much coloured by that background. I do support reform to fixed four-year terms and have been on the public record for a long time. In doing so, I accept the arguments for change. Uh, when it comes to the mechanics, I think clearly there's areas that need to be discussed, but none of these are insurmountable. There are some difficult choices there. But as has been said, the states very clearly show the way with a variety of models, including in dealing with upper houses, which in many ways is the trickiest question um, that we might come to here. I'd also say even beyond constitutional change, the parliament has as its option to consider legislation to have fixed three-year terms. It might legislate to constrain the discretion of the prime minister and the governor general to essentially fix terms now. And that would actually deal with half of the equation, should it wish to do so, and actually deal with what I think is an unfair advantage that incumbents have at the moment. I think we should have fixed, and if we can't have four, better that we have fixed three. I'd also endorse the comments that my colleague, uh, Professor Appleby, has made. And even if we move to discussion about uh, what we should put to the people, we need to recognise that the current rules are not fit for purpose. And they're nowhere near fit for purpose, to be frank. They're the best rules we could draft in the 1920s for the holding of referendums, and there has not been significant amendment of those rules in the many, many decades since. It's why we have ad hoc legislation proposed when there is a referendum. In 1999, special legislation for the Republic. We got close to a referendum in 2013. Special legislation was put forward. But that's a very poor way of dealing with these issues. Ad hoc legislation gives rise to suggestions of trying to manipulate the outcome of trying to load it one way or the other. And we need, uh, again, a holistic review of the machinery to make sure that we move beyond a paper-based information system. Perhaps we might account for the internet or social media, for example. I mean, that's a pretty basic thing to do in, in accommodating for communication, let alone dealing with mutual information and a host of other changes that are needed. So I support this process, but I'd like to see a broader process as well. Parliament engaging more deeply with the community on these issues and actually engaging with the need to have a modern fit for purpose process of actually bringing referendums to the people for their proper and informed consideration. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Williams. Well, um, that was a, a very interesting uh, a, a preliminary discussions, um, which I have some concerns about that having cracked that door open, we, we, we need to, um, well, whether we should, in fact, uh, uh, broaden our horizons. My concern with that, of course, is that if we broaden our horizons, we're not going to be dealing with the specifics. So I'd 
And I, I, I suppose I'm not adverting we do that today. I think that's a different you, process, but I support today, but think we do at some point need to broaden and have that other discussion. Good. And, and, and I think that that's a, a, a very, very good wake-up call that you're raising, uh, in fact, for, for many of you. What I'd like to do is kick the discussions off um, and invite the, the panel to give us a bit of a, a walk down memory lane, if you wouldn't mind, and um, initially just discuss how we arrived at three years in the first instance. Um, uh, why does the Constitution, why does Section 28 provide for uh, a maximum of three years? Why not two years? Why not four years? Why not five years when the, when the Constitution was first drafted? Would someone like to kick us off? I would say that it was because the Founding Fathers were very good Democrats. The Founding Fathers were very good Democrats in just about everything they did. And they thought that three years was a good period because we should have elections reasonably frequently. Because the more frequently we have an election, we, the more power the voter has. And what? I would say that um, the th the, this uh, provision, the, the pres all the provisions of the Constitution are written by men who were very good Democrats. Now, it's true they were only men, but they were very good Democrats, and that's why they put in three years. All right, thank you. Uh, historically, um, they did talk a little bit about the, the alternative of four-year terms. I think that... Uh, uh, the three-year term option was chosen partly because that was what they were familiar with in colonial parliaments at the time. Uh, but Malcolm's absolutely right. There was a very um, marked democratic character uh, to the debate in mm, Australia at the time. Mm, really well, yeah. uh, and it was electoral democracy, and mm. I think we still it have that, that focus on electoral democracy rather than a deeper form of engaged democracy between elections, and that's why I think this is an issue that would need to be dealt with uh, if we were to take four-year terms uh, seriously. But I was looking at the, at the records of this the other day, and Anne may, may know more than I do, but uh, um, somebody in one of the later stages of the constitution-making process did raise the possibility of four-year terms, but unsuccessfully. I do note, however, that they did at least resist two-year terms, which uh, yes, oh, was, right. was possible yeah. given, the, was, given yeah. the influence of the US Constitution, Thank goodness. but not in, not in that context, of course. They made the perfect choice. Um, Professor Toomey. Um, I was actually just sneakily trying to look up um, my book on the New South Wales yeah, Constitution to remind myself of... Do you want me to, um, you want me to come back to you, Professor Toomey? Uh, yeah, give me, just give me a couple of minutes and um, I'll see if I can inform you. I, I, my vague recollection is that New South Wales, they started with five and they reduced to three and then that three then affected what happened at the Commonwealth level. But I'll see if I can um, uh, give you something more concrete. You're, you're at a distinct sneaky advantage there, <laughs> Professor Toomey, uh, as opposed I, to the- I can the, find books in my office. You can see plenty <laughs> back there. We, we can see them. Uh, I don't want this to be a, you know, a, a, like a one follows the other. So I, I'm hoping that um, I'm, I'm inviting the, the, the panel to um, jump in and discuss these things rather than me pointing to you and but so away you go either of you yeah look I, I would simply add to um, Professor Saunders uh, remarks that um, while it was largely informed by the practice of the colonies um, although as I understand Western Australia had did have four-year terms at the time of Federation so there was other alternatives um, uh, that were known to the, the framers. Um, so it's informed by practice, but there were attempted amendments uh, to um, increase uh, to four-year terms, most notably brought by those delegates from Western Australia who had that experience of four-year terms. But there was a decision made, and it was largely driven by um, the, the, the democratic principles um, that were very high on the agenda at that time, um, driven by the large influence of the Chartist movement in Australia, the the, the movement, particularly in the colony of South Australia, for example, where there had been strong democratic reform and leading democratic reform in Australia. Um, and so this was uh, very high on um, the, the, the framers' um, agenda. And of course, um, the previous five decades leading to, to federation, um, the, the importance, sorry, more than five decades, uh, the importance of 
representative government and regular elections had been hard fought by those same colonists. Um, and so the idea of moving to a shorter term, uh, sorry, a longer term where you might not have um, that regular accountability um, through representative government, you can see why the, um, uh, the individuals might be um, antagonistic to it at that time. Thank you. Nothing to add. Um, can I ask a yep. question, Chair? Sure, there. Oh, I was just wondering, um, is that then important that we look at the difference between democracy then and democracy now and the way in which um, people can engage with their representatives? Like, I wonder what the influence was. You know, obvious, obviously there was no internet. Um, and um, the timing in which and the way in which citizens could engage with their parliamentarians is obviously very different to today. Um, and is that something that should be considered? Yes, it was very democratic three years, um, but we, I think, um, Professor Saunders, you sort of alluded to it, we, we, have, we don't use it very well, but we have the capacity for engagement in other ways now, um, which may mean that a longer term is not less democratic in the same way it was considered back in the 1890s and early 1900s. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're considering a move to four-year terms, you can, should consider our situation now. Um, and of course it was different um, over a hundred years ago, uh, but there are other issues now that would be raised in the mm. context of evaluating democracy. They're not beyond our capacity to deal with, uh, but unless we deal with them, I think there will be controversy over such yeah. a proposal. I think the other thing that's useful, of course, is the international and comparative experience. We've seen a shift in many countries to longer terms where it's been felt that those are reflective of how modern democracy should work. And I think both that, that internal democratic character matched with what seems to be international best practice and what actually does work overseas is important to consider. Yeah, and just in respect to that, I think one of the important things is to the temperature check of how democracy is operating now and other avenues mm. for um, participation in democracy other than just at the, um, the ballot box, but also best practice as to how that also might be improved if we went to four-year terms. Um, uh, there you go. <laughs> this is good. Uh, no, I was just going to say that that should be on the on yeah. the, um, the the committee's um, radar as well, um, because there is a, a um, reduction in the the democratic accountability moving to four year terms. So, what current processes does Australia have, or in the states as well, that allow for greater uh, participation, engagement, feedback, and accountability by the community? Um, uh, and what is best practice in other countries in terms of that type of participation. Um, we see, for example, um, in the States, but also in a number of uh, um, international jurisdictions, a greater use of citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries um, uh, outside of the uh, um, electoral um, process. So there are other best practice mechanisms that, that could be implemented if a reform to four-year terms was considered. And I think the other one there is you've got Aedes petitioning, which of course major reforms mm. in the United Kingdom. They've been very effective in leading to an enormous shift in number of petitions with, I know there's been discussion in this parliament about guaranteeing perhaps, uh, or at least assuring a parliamentary discussion where there's a sufficient number of signatures. And I think that would be a, you know, a wise thing if you move to four years to have a package of things that actually gave confidence that other aspects of the work of parliament were being enhanced. Um, and quite apart from terms, that should happen anyway, of course. Can I, can I just say, and, and, and to you, uh, Professor Williams, like you, you suggested we should be having a broad package of reform. Um, my experience, for all it's worth, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but my experience with just about everything is the broader you make it, the less likely you are to achieve change. Um, that you just end up fighting the battle on too many fronts. And I, my, my thoughts are that the best chance for reform is incremental. Uh, and that you attack one issue at a time. Um, but, and just while I'm speaking, and I've got a whole lot of points I would love to question, I don't know how our time will go today. And can I respond to that point? Yeah, first? Sure, I, I, sure. I agree, That's, and I agree completely with that. And uh, as someone who's studied this for a long time, I think it's very obvious many referendums fail because they're too ambitious, <laughs> um, they lack bipartisanship. Um, and so I'm actually the strong supporter of incremental, quite pragmatic mm. change. And mm. it's why I'd actually focus on things often that are just sensible things that don't raise political controversy that frankly need to be fixed. Mm. One good example is simply the ability of our jurisdictions to implement uh, cooperative schemes, mm. which save public money. People have said for a long time it needs to be done, but in fact it, it's a real problem in the court system that nobody really talks about but, but should be done. But mm. my point 
is that we need a process of actually a larger discussion to identify what those proposals are. Mm -hmm. And something like fixed four-year terms keeps popping out of the woodwork in part because uh, politicians generate the discussion, but perhaps you might find a broader discussion would Ooh. identify strong community demand for a set of less contentious reforms which are desperately needed to save taxpayers' dollars that might be put forward without contention and may actually have a high chance of success. But we do so incrementally and slowly and deliberately. But at the moment, the process does a very poor job of even identifying things, apart from we just keep going round and round with the same issues Ooh. in this area. Um, and I think that's the problem, is actually Ooh. identification and having that discussion Ooh. in a pragmatic, considered way that then identifies a proposal that would go forward with hopefully a significant chance of success. Ooh. Yeah, you know, just it's on a different issue, but the length of term, and I'll, while I've got the floor, I'll take the opportunity. But um, Mr. McCarris, in particular, you you back strongly the three the current three year terms. Yes. Um, and, and and I I am one who thinks probably at this stage that we should go to a four year term and keep a pretty simple kind of change. But if the three year term, uh, you know, a regular more regular elections, which seems to be out of step with almost... I, I can't find another place in the world now having three-year elections. There are seven. Are there? The yeah. US House of Representatives has two years. Yeah, I, I do know that, but, but they're New, actually New half, half elections, example. aren't they? Sorry? Sorry? New Zealand's another example, I think. Yeah. New Zealand has a three-year term. Three-year yeah. term. Well, Just there are a few around. All right. No, but, but, what, but, you know, if it's such a good thing for democracy, why not have a two-year term? Because, in fact, we've only been having a 32-month term anyhow. Oh, like the average, the average through through the period since 1901 is a little less than 32 months. So, uh, you, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm not suggesting we go to two years. I'm saying you tell me why we shouldn't. You know, if if elections are such a good thing for for a democracy, why not have them more often? I don't think we should, but uh, but but uh, but it stands to reason if three is better than four, why isn't two? You know, why don't we ask the question, the two not better than okay, three? Okay, well, there's a simple answer. I am not a member of the Australian Constitution Change for Change's Sake Brigade. Mm. It's as simple as that. I am proud of the fact that I have never voted yes at a referendum. When I say that to people, they say, surely you must have voted yes for the Aboriginal question. I say, well, actually, I was not entitled to vote for that mm. because I'm an elector of the ACT. But since I've been entitled to vote, I have never voted yes at a referendum. I gave consideration in respect of one question to voting yes, and that was the interchange of powers proposal in 1984, but I was emphatically hostile to the simultaneous elections proposal, mm. so hostile that the Liberal Party, which had no credibility on the subject at the time, actually asked me to do an ABC video denouncing this proposal, and I thought, well, I might as well vote no on both questions, but the interchange of powers proposal is the only one to which I gave any serious consideration to voting yes. And uh, my position is very simple. Uh, as I say, I'm not a member of the Australian Constitution Change for Change of Sake Brigade, and that is my approach. And for that reason, I'm not, I'm not I can't say, I'm not in agreement with Professor Appleby or Professor Williams, really. Um, I'm perfectly happy with the way the people have handled these questions. I'm not happy with the way the politicians have handled these questions, but I am happy with the way the people have handled these questions. All right. Thanks, uh, Mr McCarris. Uh, Professor Toomey, did you want to jump in there? Did you find what you were looking for? Uh, I didn't actually, but I did find something else which is quite interesting. So this is an article from um, where the Interparliamentary Union did a um, survey of parliamentary terms um, and said um, out of 77 countries which have a bicameral parliamentary system like Australia, 71 have either four or five year terms, mm -hmm. while only three, including Australia, have three year terms, being Australia, Mexico and the Philippines. Uh, in a bicameral parliament. So presumably that was excluding um, New Zealand because it's a unicameral parliament. But um, as a general principle, if you're looking at the statistics here, I've got up on the screen, um, uh, uh, the vast majority of parliaments use four or five year terms. What you need to be doing here, however, is balancing two things. One is on the one hand, the accountability of parliament to the people, which is very important. And the other is the ability of parliaments to govern uh, in the longer term with longer term interests in mind rather than spending their whole times out there campaigning. 
um, seems to me it's inefficient if politicians are focused for most of their term on having to campaign to be re-elected rather than actually doing the business of governing. Um, so can, can I just ask, can I, can I play devil's advocate on that point? Uh, and, I'm, and I'm happy to throw this open to all of you. Um, only ever having served for, you know, being the, 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 the veteran of three and a half years that I am, how true in fact is it that um, with a three year term that governments uh, spend that their last 12 or, or eight months or so in the politics of the election rather than governing. How true is that? You know, let's pull that apart a little bit. I mean, just because you've got an election coming up doesn't mean that the business of government grinds to a halt and everybody goes out on the hustings. <coughs> 12, I mean, certainly once the election is called, that, that happens, that's, that's natural. But how true is it that, in your respective views, that um, a three-year government leads to the, the last 12 months or eight months of, of a lack of governance? Well, the question is not only how true is it, but how true need it be? Um, if we said, well, we don't want you to spend 12 months campaigning. Uh, and frankly, if the term were fixed, that would be less of a temptation. One of the reasons for the temptation to campaign over the last 12 months is that the press starts saying, wonder when they're going to call the election? Yeah, maybe it'll be now, maybe it'll be later. Uh, and so all that speculation builds up whether or not that's impacting uh, on government. If the term was fixed, that problem would at least be put to bed. Uh, and I think that uh, it's, it's not necessary to spend all that time um, campaigning and taking your eye off the governing ball. I think it's, um, it's obviously very I... hard. Sorry, Anne, you go. OK, um, just to add something, I don't think it's so much a matter of the government stopping governing, but I think the focus of government changes in the period before an election. So you, you can also see it, for example, in, in, in the states where you have fixed four year terms, that in the final year of the term, the government in its budget, for example, will be focusing on giving goodies to people that will make them seem popular, whereas the, the first budget or the second budget um, after they become elected is more likely to have the things, that the, the medicine that is necessary to fix the economy. Problem is when you've only got three years and the reality is of that three years, you usually only have about two and a half. Um, uh, there's not a lot of time to get through the nasty things that you actually need to do before you start having to do the nice things you need to do in order to be able to get elected. Or your term just gives you a little bit more time to be able to do the things that may not be popular but are necessary that governments are reluctant to do towards the end. So it's not so much the problem of people stopping governing because they're out and their electorate's doing campaigning. There's a bit of that. But it's also the government in terms of what it's doing and how it needs to be perceived will put off doing unpopular things for a particular time or will change its budgetary approach in the final year before an election um, is held. Um, and that may not necessarily be actually for the good of the economy generally. I mean, they'll put off hard reforms and that's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, I, I think, picking up on Anne's point, I think the budgetary cycle is critical because, of course, that's how so much reform is driven in this country. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a particular cycle where we know that the budget before an election will be less likely to tackle major reforms for good reason. And it may be there aren't many budgets available in a term of government, particularly if we're talking two and a half years. So if you add a further budgetary cycle into that, that's a very significant addition in terms of the opportunities for a government to actually drive some reform, and in particular to drive reform that might take a couple of budgetary cycles to do so. Yep. Uh, and I think, of course, you can't generalise too much at the moment, but when you add in the leadership instability we've had over an extended period as well, those things collectively have you know, put us in a difficult place when it comes to driving some of the structural, economic and other reforms that I think the community would like to see emerging from Parliament. And my view is that a fixed four-year term would not provide any guarantees whatsoever, but it would simply provide a greater opportunity for a government to drive an agenda in accordance with its mandate and to have an extra budgetary cycle and extra opportunities to do so. Um, I would just add uh, to this, I mean, one of the uh, 
issues with this debate, which has now been happening for decades around a move to four-year terms, and we saw it in the States as well, is that there's actually very little evidence um, and there's very little research in terms of the, um, uh, the shift to, to four-year terms um, and whether, in fact, uh, these benefits around um, uh, the, the conduct um, of... Uh, the, the government and long-term planning and stability um, and taking on larger projects um, would actually play out in a four-year term as opposed to a three-year term. Um, there's lots of principled arguments made, there's lots of good reasons and you can see the logic behind them, but in fact we're actually unable, unfortunately, to point to studies that have um, uh, confirmed um, or, or, um, uh, or not these, these issues. Um, and just to pick up on a point that Professor Saunders was saying is that often it's not um, uh, an issue necessarily between uh, a three and four year term, but the, the fixing versus the flexibility of the term and knowing when the election is going to be called. Um, and that has an impact not just on um, the, uh, the politicians um, and government, but also on the public servants. Um, when there's a lot of conjecture that an election is likely to be called soon, um, there's a question about what the public service does in that situation. When do the caretaker conventions kick in, um, what do they do uh, in relation uh, to their, their roles. Um, and in that respect, I would just um, point the uh, committee, uh, if it hasn't already looked, at the work of Professor Anne Tiernan um, at the Centre for Governance and Public Policy at Griffith University. Um, in her book, Caretaker Conventions in Australia, she does talk about this impact on public service as well. All right, this might be a good opportunity to go to one of the questions that uh, has been tweeted in. Uh, and it's from uh, former Queens, Queensland Greens and Democrat Senator Andrew Bartlett. Uh, and he asks this question. I feel a little bit like Tony Jones here. <laughs> uh, given elections are one of the few genuine mechanisms the public has for holding their elected representatives accountable, how would it help accountability to have elections less often? Why not just amend the Electoral Act to have fixed date for the election every three years, which is... Um, Professor Appleby is what you've just touched on. But I think the, what, what uh, uh, Mr Bartlett is referring to is how, by, by extending from three to four, how will that lead to greater accountability of, of the parliament, particularly the government? It wouldn't. I think that's what he's suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, again, you would need to think about the accountability mechanisms and whether it would be necessary to provide some other accountability trade-offs. For example, uh, this parliament elsewhere is considering the effectiveness of question time at the moment. Mm. There are other debates going on in the parliament about other aspects of the way the parliament works. So uh, is there a package of parliamentary accountability mechanisms that you might think about that could compensate for um, uh, extending the um, opportunity to hold uh, MPs to account through the election process. Well, I think it's, it's undeniable that that impact would be had, but of course it's just not the only issue at stake. Um, mm. There's issues of democratic accountability and good governance, and the community would like to see both. And uh, we could, of course, maximise democratic accountability to such a ridiculous a point that would maximise it, but actually provide no opportunities for good governance. There's a spectrum there that mm -hmm. needs to be looked at. And, and I suppose the view that I've, as many others have come to, is we're at the wrong point on that spectrum. We should push out democratic accountability to four years in order to meet community demands for more capacity for good government. But that's the choice. It's where you lie along that. But I also agree strongly that if we push that spectrum out to four years, then yes, let's look at mechanisms for non-ballot box accountability to be enhanced uh, over the intervening period. I had a question for Professor Toomey that, that builds on this. Mm, sure. um, Professor Toomey, you mentioned in your opening statement um, the issues <laughs> that we've all seen in the UK with the Fixed Term mm. Act, mm. Um, but particularly about what happens after a vote of no confidence in the, yep. in the government. And I was wondering if you might just be able to expand on that a little bit, um, what the different options are and why it wouldn't just be the case that if the parliament loses the confidence in the government, that would be a trigger for a general election? Mm. Well, uh, the New South Wales provision, which partly the UK provision was, was um, copied off or, or um, followed, uh, has in it, within it an opportunity for there to be a change of government without an election. Um, so there may be some circumstances in which an election may be inappropriate for one reason or another. 
Um, it could be, you know, you're in the middle of a war. It could be because you're, um, uh, you've got, as in the UK, you had this sort of Brexit date looming. There may be all sorts of reasons why. Um, so in Australia, there have been, um, sorry, th th there's two things at issue here. One is the possibility that the government lost confidence um, temporarily and can regain confidence. So it may be there was a no confidence vote against you that you lost because two of your members are in the toilet and one was away sick. Okay, so you've got <laughs> so that opportunity of 14 sacked. days or eight days <laughs> yeah. for people to come back and vote again because you don't want to change governments just because of an accident, right? So there's that aspect. So that gives the government an opportunity to um, regain confidence. May also be that the government um, lost confidence because it, you know, introduced an unpopular budget or some other kind of reason, which it can rectify and continue to govern. So, for example, the Harper government in Canada in 2008 looked like it was about to lose confidence, managed to prorogue, bring out a new budget, get back confidence. Okay, so there's those sort of issues for regaining confidence. But then there are the issues about whether or not you should be able to have somebody else actually does have the confidence of parliament, can continue to govern. It's really an issue of whether you should be able to swap governments mid-term. Mm. Um, and so some flexibility needs to allow for that. Um, now, in the UK, that's very messy. It doesn't explain how that can happen. Um, and there are problems that if the Prime Minister advises the Queen to prorogue Parliament, then there's no ability for Parliament to show that it has confidence in someone else to form a government. Um, but if you look at the New South Wales legislation and indeed the Queensland um, legislation, I think it was, um, there are provisions in there. So that in New South Wales, there's a provision that says that the governor can decide instead of having an election to appoint someone else to form a government and in doing so must take into an, into account whether the House has vote, expressed confidence in someone else to form a government. Uh, and there was something in the Queensland legislation that I thought was quite nifty about that too, but um, currently um, has just passed from my mind what it was. Um, but there was something in Queensland about um, what happens if the House itself decides that somebody else should be able to form a government. So they're things that should be able to be thought about. It's quite tricky if you just have a provision that says, right, there's a vote of no confidence against you automatically in election. So, and I guess my, my follow up question is for anyone is why, if we move to fixed four year terms, why should it be any different than it is now, that procedure? Fixed. What? It's the fixed. Yeah. Oh, that's what I thought would be. Mm. Why should what be any different? So, if we move to four year terms, why would the procedure of what happens if you lose a vote of no confidence in the House, why would it need to change necessarily? Or should it change? Well, you just. Well, need, you, well, sorry. No, you go. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, sorry. Um, well, normally, if you lose a vote of no confidence in the House, the, the, the Prime Minister has two options. Um, yeah. One is to resign. Uh, and the other is to advise an election. Yeah. What happens with fixed term parliaments is you take away the choice of advising an election. Mm. So that then potentially yeah. leaves you with only one possibility and that is the government resigns. But what happens if there's no one else that can actually form a government that yeah. has majority support and you can't have an election? That's where you get stuck. So that's why you need this trigger in fixed term parliament um, provisions to show that you can get to an election to resolve that position where on the one hand, the government doesn't have confidence, but nobody else has confidence. Yeah. You've got to have some way out of that to get to an election. So it's one of the exceptions that Professor Saunders was talking about in her opening. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to, so the, the constitution's so open-ended at the moment <laughs> in section 28 and the other one, section five, I guess. Um, it's a maximum three-year term, but it can be d dissolved earlier than that by the Governor-General, and we know the Governor-General will act on the Prime Minister's advice, at least normally. Um, but if you're going to have fixed terms, then that's no longer going to be true. So you've got to identify the circumstances in which there's an exception to the fixed term. And that then drives you down the path of saying, well, what will those circumstances be? Will it just be a vote of no confidence? What does a vote of no mm -hmm. confidence mean? Will it be rejection of another bill that really matters to the government, um, which the government is prepared to say is a matter of confidence? 
Uh, will it come back down to an amendment to the budget in the House, which is, of course, un unheard of? You know, exactly what would trigger that? Mm. Uh, and then again, what do we do if it was an accidental vote of the kind that Anne was talking about, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, as soon as you start moving from the absolutely flexible, flexible. Uh, discretion to resolve on the face of the constitution, which we know is then all wrapped around by constitutional convention, then you start, need to start thinking about the text. And then also you need to build in all of those scenarios nobody has ever thought of, and that's why in the state constitutions you see in addition to these procedures that you can still have a dissolution in accordance with established constitutional convention. Well, in some. Not in in, in all. some, that's right, yeah, not I in think all. that's a really weird Yeah, thing. New South Wales and Queensland. Yeah, yeah. And then indeed, or in the bill that uh, uh, David Coleman MP was working on that ultimately didn't good get put, the idea was that simply extraordinary circumstances mm. could justify a dissolution, but they weren't defined. But an escape clause might be included to provide for the unknowable and circumstances that we just can't contemplate at the moment. I was actually just looking at that uh, provision as, as you said that uh, 5A of uh, Coleman's bill, um, which provided a, a catch-all uh, provision. Um, what's the, the, the merits, the, the advantages or, or, or disadvantages of that catch-all provision, which, which, as you say, basically provides for uh, extraordinary circumstances um, and it is in accordance with established constitutional conventions to do so? Mm. Well, it is, it is simply to recognise that perhaps we can't fully capture all of the desirable circumstances that would lead to an election, an early election, and again, we can look at the, the remarkable circumstances in the United Kingdom and that we perhaps would never have contemplated there, that maybe there is an escape clause that says if we get to something truly remarkable and extraordinary, then a residual discretion should apply. And of course, the danger of that is perhaps that will be misused. Um, perhaps people will say it's extraordinary when it's not. But obviously, in the drafting of that bill, the view was taken that we should foreshadow this um, so that there is an escape clause. It's a very subjective term. Um, and, and as you point out, um, it could be it could be triggered on on the views of uh, assumedly the prime minister giving advice to the governor general. Um, I would think so, though it may be justiciable. Um, so it could be the subject of challenge. Can I just say? Uh, so there's two issues here, aren't there? Mm. One is whether you say. Uh, it's fixed and can only be dissolved in these circumstances unless something exceptional is happening. And I think, but I may be wrong, that in some of the states, the question of whether it's exceptional has to be agreed with the leader of the opposition. Uh, so there's a bit of bi bipartisanship about whether the exceptional circumstances have arisen. But the other question that you raise, Mr Chairman, is whether you just leave some residual discretion to say any, it may be dissolved in other circumstances covered by constitutional conventions. And that's a different mm. kettle of fish. I mean, constitutional convention wouldn't actually necessarily cover mm. exceptional no. circumstances. No. No, uh, and the difficulty with that um, is that we may not be agreed on what those constitutional conventions are. Mm. So it's hard to explain what mm. the bill actually means. Uh, and uh, um, pretty easy to run an argument that says, well, you know, actually, uh, it's not that extraordinary. It's not that fixed. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Mr Simmons. Thanks very much, um, Mr Chairman, and thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, I might preface my question um, by saying that um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm wary of any change, I guess, that might surprise people given, given my side of politics. But um, um, I find, the, I find um, Professor Williams' uh, argument about um, an extra budget cycle um, compelling, relatively compelling, um, but I also agree with Malcolm in terms of um, that there doesn't appear to be evidence that that prime ministers necessarily abuse this trust in terms of calling what, what you yeah, would define as an early election. So, they don't abuse the so, so I, I wanted to pose the question, and maybe you might refer to other jurisdictions as well. Is that is 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 the committee incorrect in 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 both assuming a four-year and a fixed-term scenario, um, given that given that it opens up all these things that we've just been talking about that have to be dealt with, and given that simple referendums are often the ones that, that pass, would would it not be better to put to the people simply to change the three to three to a four 
And other, I mean, you'd have to deal with the Senate still, I understand that. That would be a bad idea. But, but three to a four, and then say that you could still, the Prime Minister still has the, the discretion to dissolve it early. That would be a very bad idea because that would actually lead to the speculation that we don't get at the moment. The truth of the matter is that most elections are House of Representatives and half the Senate and are held in the months of October, November, December, and there is a regular pattern every three years, so it's semi-fixed anyway. The present parliamentary term and the immediate past parliamentary term are a bit different. Had Malcolm Turnbull taken my advice and not had a double dissolution in the year 2016, we would be looking to an election in November, December 2016 and then 2019 and so forth and so forth. But because he had the double dissolution, uh, we now have the situation where it's a very, very good bet that the election is two years away. That is, it will be late November 2021, uh, because that restores to the normal cycle of House of Reps plus Half Senate in October, November, December of each three year period, which doesn't lead to speculation about early elections. The only speculation about early elections you get are when a Prime Minister is thinking of a double dissolution. That's really the only speculation. But, uh, but I don't See, there won't be speculation about the next election. Everyone will just but I don't know that the election is going to be in November 2021. But I don't understand why we care about speculation in terms of an early Sorry? election. I don't, I, don't, I, well, don't, I, don't I don't buy into the argument that we necessarily care if there's speculation. Well, I don't like if, care. The, if the press wants to work themselves into a frenzy about when the election date is, well, so be it. But I'm talking about... Uh, so I, I'm not I'm not saying move to four turns because of that, that's I guess that's what I'm saying by I don't accept the principle that you'd have to fix it to end some speculation because was why why bother I think I think it's more I think I'd be more inclined to accept the argument that you move to four turns because you've got a bit, an extra budget cycle well, and, and then leave the Senate reforms. unchanged. Well, no, I think you'd still then have to deal with the Senate in, as we would in any, well, any would scenario. Do? But what I'm we'll, asking we'll, we'll is... We'll come to the, what, that in the second half of it, the is it, is it, you know, do other jurisdictions necessarily tie four-year terms with fixed? I mean, or is this something that it's unique because that's the question we've, we've, we've asked? I mean, well, you're right. You're right. It's a question that's open. Yeah. And interestingly, I was thinking as you were asking the question, when the states, when at least some of the states moved to fixed terms, they went through an intermediate phase where they had it semi-fixed, right, okay. fixed for three years mm. and flexible for the last year, uh, and then eventually they decided they'd fully fix it. So there was that period of experimentation as they moved uh, from one to the other. Look, I think it just comes down to the um, various arguments you can run on either side. Flexible are much easier to design. You're quite, you're quite right. In favour of fixed, there is the expectation that it'll be fixed just because they're fixed uh, in the states. Uh, the argument that, well, if you're moving to four-year terms so as to give yourself all that time to govern without uh, speculation about the elections, why would you <coughs> also build in a component that allows continuing speculation about the elections, whether you sort of follow Malcolm's mm. views about uh, Prime Minister's uh, actions or not. Uh, and then just general scepticism, I think, about um, the power of the Prime Minister um, being left relatively unchecked. Mm. So those, I think, are the issues that you have to weigh up in coming down on one side or, or the other on that question. Does the panel have a view about whether you think the Australian people would be more likely to accept four-year terms if it was fixed, or would they be more likely to accept four-year terms if it was unfixed? My own view is if they're going to accept it at all, mm -hmm. they would expect it to be fixed. fixed. But OK, nice. No, that's yeah. fine. Nice. Well, question there's I was been asking. a situation yeah. in the states more recently, so when Queensland mm -hmm. moved to four years terms, they didn't do this interim um, uh, sort of mixed, fixed, flexible, like yes. we saw in uh, <laughs> um, uh, South Australia and Victoria. They just went straight to fixed four-year terms, um, and that was, as we know, accepted at a, a plebiscite um, in 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and if you look at, I mean, they're absolutely separable, as you say, but if you look at many of the proponents of change, they often focus more on fixed than the length of the parliament, yeah. like the business right. community, for example. What they're looking yeah. for is certainty. And if you look at also how we prepare for elections in terms of getting people on the roll and things like that, if we've got a knowable date, then you can actually stagger and use money more effectively to drive people onto the roll and, 
There are all sorts of advantages in that sort of certainty. That means I agree you could separate them, but it would be a harder referendum to win, I think. Mm. Um, Can I just add there, if you go back to look at Queensland, um, in 1991 they did hold a referendum on unfixed four-year terms. That one failed, but their 2016 referendum on fixed four-year terms succeeded. Um, Now, we we can't know for sure whether that's just because fixed is more popular than unfixed, but you do have an example in one jurisdiction where they ran one and it failed and then sometime later they ran the other and it succeeded. Um, The other point I'd just make is that the the assumption that um, prime ministers will never abuse their power um, and will always behave appropriately um, was one that had always applied in the United Kingdom as well. Um, In fact, the whole United Kingdom constitution works on the basis of convention and that everyone will be a good chap and play by the rules of cricket. Uh, That's been completely upended with Brexit Um, and um, what's been happening lately. And if you talk to, you know, all my constitutional colleagues in the United Kingdom have been absolutely horrified by the fact that prime ministers are prepared to these days put the Queen in a difficult position by proroguing parliament in certain circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the assumptions that had always been made that people will behave in a particular way um, will not always be the case when certain unknown stresses are put on to the, the political situation. So I think we should be a bit wary about those kind of assumptions because they won't always play out. Well, my, I would disagree with what uh, Anne has just said, other, otherwise completely agreeing with everybody on the panel. Fixing has a much greater appeal to the electorate than non-fixing. The 1988 referendum went down in a screaming heap because it was not fixed, and for various other reasons. But the point I would make, uh, contrary to what Anne says, is you need to forget, you need to remember that the United Kingdom has a unicameral parliament in which it is natural to expect elections at any old time, whereas we have these fixed six-year terms for the senators, which mean that we do have a normal election period, October, November, December, each three years, for the House of Representatives and half the Senate, that has the effect of reducing the likelihood that a Prime Minister will reduce, will abuse the power. That's why I assert the Prime Minister has never abused the power to call an early election, or to name the election date for that matter. Well, with one perhaps exception, Malcolm Fraser's double the solution in 1983, and he was thumped in the election. That's the only case I can actually think of where you could argue seriously that the Prime Minister abused the power to name the election date. That was an abuse of power, and he was thumped at the election. I mean, I personally, I think it's very hard to argue they ever used their power simply because it's a power unconstrained. Yeah, discretion. It's, it's purely discretionary. So. I can't, even that I wouldn't say is an instance of abuse. It's simply they exercise the discretion. The problem is the discretion is so unconstrained that it could be exercised for factors that, you know, arguably aren't in the best interests of the nation and might be better constrained by legislation or by constitutional amendment. So I wasn't aware that the 1988 referendum was not for fixed terms, that it was just for four year terms. So. That's the case, is it? It was the 1988 referendum was just for four-year terms. All manner of my political science colleagues would tell me that they voted no, but would have voted yes if it had been a fixed four-year term. I know lots of people who've done no, me that. 1988 was probably a bit before four-year fixed terms mm. um, really became consolidated at the state level too. Mm. Yep. Well, that's true. But then I'm completely unimpressed by the argument that we at the federal level must follow the states. Oh, so am I, but I'm just I'm saying... I'm completely unimpressed by that argument. I mean, one, the thing that people <laughs> don't really seem to realise is that in, well, in three jurisdictions we have unicameral parliaments. Now, the interesting cases are Victoria and Western Australia. The Legislative Council terms are fixed at four years, and there's no rotation of members. Now, that leads to me to say if you're going to do away with the rotation of senators, I consider your arguments worth considering. Uh, but I, I certainly don't consider the idea of an eight-year term for the senators, and I certainly don't consider the idea that we should have a four-year term for the House of Representatives and leave the Senate term unchanged, because that would simply produce all the speculation that people deplore. 
for all these reasons, well, you understand my position, don't you? Yes, yes. and we'll certainly unpack that uh, a bit in more detail in, in the second half. Mm. Mr Ramsey, did you uh, have well, any other my, questions? My, my, the, the issue I was going to raise was very similar to what Julian brought up about the fact that once we bring the fixed for the fixed term into the four-year argument, it becomes a lot more complex. Um, I, uh, my question, uh, you, you referred to the, someone referred to the Queensland referendum to extend their terms. It, it's, I don't, that is not uniform across the states that they've all required referendum to change their parliamentary terms. Does anyone have, a, have an understanding which states they needed to have a referendum, which ones did? I'm pretty confident South yes. the, in South Australia we didn't have one. No. And, 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 and the reason for asking the question, uh, is it a good idea that the, that the term of government should be within the constitution or should it remain something a bit more flexible? Because if we make a change, it is one of those changes that you remain for a really long time because it's so hard to change the constitution. So would it then not be a better thing that, that uh, with, with some kind of restraints, there, there is ability for parliaments to adjust those terms when, when it's seen appropriate you know, within the public sphere? Well, I'm not in favour of that. All I can tell you is, in New South Wales and Queensland, they did need a referendum or referendums to do this fixing of four-year terms. But uh, Victoria, South Australia, West Australia, Tasmania, in fact, those two out of eight, two out of um, eight jurisdictions mm. have this referendum requirement, and the others, the Parliament was able to do it. And that makes it so much simpler, doesn't it? But but it's very um, often. The it also parliament. makes it, you know, it also makes it. If, if the public are making a decision about this, it's sort of like this is final. Like we haven't changed this 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 line in the constitution for 120 years, and it might be like this for the next 120. You, you've so got to get it right. Well, if actually you, uh, if it's within, if it's in the the the, the remit of the, the relevant state parliaments. And you know, people don't like it. You can actually change it back or do something else. You know, and mm. so that's why I raised the question. Even though I'd, I'd have to say, I think the chances to get a referendum up that actually takes these prescribing things out of the current constitution would, would be more problematic than probably just about anything we've proposed up to now. But, mm. but, Professor Saunders, uh, I mean, you're right that if uh, um, that most of the state parliaments would find it easier to change these provisions uh, than the Commonwealth, even when a state has a referendum requirement. Ooh. For reasons we don't fully understand, they tend to pass at the state level, uh, certainly more often than they pass uh, federally. Uh, but the states that um, uh, leave some of these changes to their parliaments may nevertheless have special majorities in the parliaments. Yeah. We're not mm. necessarily no, talking... I accept that would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but that's not, not an option that, that, mm. that you have available mm. to you. Mm. Professor Toomey. Uh, yeah, could I just um, add something in there? The, the one interesting one is Western Australia. Uh, so they do have sort of fixed year for four year terms, but um, why I say sort of is because mm. they didn't want a referendum um, and so they didn't go to a referendum and because of that they had to retain the ability of the governor to still dissolve parliament early. Mm. So it's a bit more like the Canadian fixed term parliaments mm. in terms of you've got legislation saying that you've got a fixed date for the election, but actually you can still go to the governor and get an early election if you want and nothing will stop you from doing it. Um, and that is because they needed to avoid holding a referendum. So the, the Western Australian position is a, is, is a sort of a um, pseudo fixed four year term simply because they were avoiding the need to hold a referendum. Yeah. Uh, New South Wales and Queensland certainly did hold a referendum. I'm not sure what Victoria did. Cheryl, do you know if Victoria no, held a referendum? No referendum. So certainly didn't have a referendum no. and doesn't have a referendum requirement for that part of the constitution. Yeah, and certainly Tasmania doesn't. So they, they def definitely don't need one. But that doesn't help us in the federal sphere because no. certainly no. we do require a referendum to change it. To, to extend the term, but not to fix the term. To extend well. the term beyond three years. <laughs> Arguable. <laughs> Arguable. Well, you could, fix it. you could fix it by legislation, actually. 
Well, and that's that's another option, but would require a, a referendum. Yes. This idea yes. that yes. the referendum is to, in fact, uh, amend Section 28 uh, mm. to give the power to the Parliament, Parliament. to mm. fix the terms, mm. um, and maybe there may be restrictions placed around that sort of a minimum or a maximum or a special majority requirement. Um, although I think that um, uh, the point that you made, Mr. Ramsey, at the end, that that in terms of a um, a, a political sell at a referendum would be extremely difficult. Difficult, um, sort of telling the Australian public that this is now going to be, be uh, trust us <laughs> determined by the, trust the parliamentarians the themselves into the future. And so I think whenever we're thinking about um, constitutional reform, that that has to be uh, part of that discussion. Irrespective of whether uh, a, a halfway house was sought and just an extension of three <coughs> to four years without fixing it, that would then have the knock-on effect of how we deal with the Senate. Mm. So, um, and, and that which we'll explore after morning tea um, is one of the, the principal stumbling blocks uh, I think we're all agreed on. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Not at the moment, I think it's... Right, Ron? Well, yeah, but we're coming back. Aren't we? We're yeah. coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy to do that after I, I'll be able to remember them because I've written them down. <laughs> <laughs> Just excuse me one second. Uh, on that note, we'll uh, break and we'll come back at uh, quarter to 11. Um, so feel free to have a, a cup of tea and a biscuit and um, we'll get stuck into the really meaty side of things. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, so we've, we're now going to move into the second phase of the discussions. Um, and uh, what I really want to try and do now is look at if we were to look at uh, an extension from three to four years, um, whether they be fixed or not, what are, the, what are the mechanics of doing that and what are the problems that arise? Um, what are the unintended consequences that you might foresee by um, an extension of, of the, of the four-year term? And I'll, I'll kick off the, the question and I'm going to ask each of you to address the, the rather large elephant in the room and that is uh, how we deal with the Senate. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I might start with you first, Professor Toomey. And if you're not ready, I can come back to you because you probably oh, weren't expecting okay. me to. But I'd like to keep was, you on your toes. I was having a little read of the um, Constitutional Commission's report of 1988, which sets out the whole history of Senate terms and various proposals to change them, which is quite interesting. Hmm. Uh, so are you right to go, Professor Toomey? Sure. Yep. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure if you heard the question that I asked. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, yes. So the, the, Excellent. Uh, what Sorry, I, what was the question? <laughs> so the, the question I'm asking is in relation to whether you can address the issues of how we deal with the Senate if we extend to four years, whether they be fixed or floating. Okay. Uh, well, if we look at what's happened in the States, it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, so in New South Wales and South Australia, they just doubled the term of the, um, so from four to eight. Um, so um, upper house uh, members have eight year terms and um, half go out every four years. Uh, in Victoria and Western Australia, they took the other approach and that was to bring the term down to the same as the lower house. So that's four each. Um, so no um, extended term for the upper house. Um, and Tasmania, being the more eccentric of the lot, um, has a um, four-year term in the lower house and six years in the upper house, um, with upper house elections that are on a fixed term basis that, that are unrelated to the lower house elections. Um, so they're effectively the three options that you can have in terms of terms. Uh, I suppose the other option is, and this is the option that the um, Constitutional Commission um, said, which was um, in the report I was just looking at, and that was if you had um, not fixed terms at the um, uh, for the lower house, so you had a maximum of four years, then you tie your Senate terms to two of however long the House of Representatives goes for. So um, if the House of Reps went for three years or three and a half years, then it would be six years or seven years. If it went the full went the full four years, then it would be up to eight years. But the Senate terms would be tied to just two terms of the lower house. So that's the option there. Sweet. I guess the question then is whether there is value in having um, a house that is uh, that has the longevity of people elected under the previous election um, which is the system we have. And the reason we have that is for continuity um, in the upper house, so that at each election, there will still be half the members in the upper house who are elected under the previous government. And therefore the idea is to sort of um, leaven things out at the, at the upper house level, um, making it less inclined to the swings that might happen in the lower house. Um, so the question for the committee is, is there still value in that? Um, does that, um, really affect the Senate's role or is the Senate's role now different because of proportional representation and because the way the Senate is elected and um, the fact that it has more small parties um, and independent senators, uh, whether it's that constitution of the House as a Senate that makes it different from the House of Representatives. Um, so it comes down to fundamental questions. What, what's your Senate there for? What's it actually there to achieve? Um, if it's as a House of Review um, that's meant to review legislation, meant to be less partisan in that regard, or meant to be wider in terms of its um, 
of its uh, representation of um, different groups, uh, then maybe the longevity aspect of having longer terms and, and uh, roll over every um, term of the House of Reps may not be necessary anymore. I think that's something that needs to be thought about. Uh, but clearly in previous times there was concerns amongst people that you would be neutering the powers of the Senate if you reduce them to the same length of term as the lower house. So I'm still not absolutely convinced that that's right. What's the views of the other members of the panel on the, the that neutering the powers of the Senate by bringing them down to four-year terms to, to match the house, if that's the way we went? Two terms. Is that what you mean? Two terms rather than four terms. No, 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 I think the argument that Professor Toomey's raising is that if you bring the Senate terms down to four years, yes. then you're neutering the powers oh, of the Senate. Well, I, well, I, I don't agree with that. I, I look, that's the only model of the four-year term that I'm willing to contemplate. Fix the term of the House Representative so that the election is on the last Saturday in November every four years. That's not very prescriptive. <laughs> but get it out of the way of the Victorian term, which is four years and so fixed. Uh, the Senate, I would, in the present context, have a, every election would be a, the equivalent of a double dissolution election as presently, but without the need for the re rotation of senators to be re-established, of course, because there would be no ro rotation of senators. Uh, the main reform that I advocate is for the Senate voting system to be a decent system. The present system is an absolute disgrace and the politicians should be ashamed of themselves that such a horrible system has been imposed. But under this reform, I would then say the ballot paper should copy the New South Wales legislative council ballot paper, where 21 are elected at each election, but you'd elect 12. Just copy the New South Wales legislative council ballot paper in principle I could have brought such a ballot paper with me. It's very huge. But the point is, you could justify such a change, really, in this way. You could justify it in the way I justify the New South Wales system. I don't like the New South Wales system, but I do justify the system on the ground that you are giving some chance to small parties. In New South Wales, the Animal Justice Party actually has two members neither of whom needed to game the system. In Victoria, there's one who needed to game the system to get in. Uh, but the New South Wales Dead Sub Council, you have two from the Animal Justice Party, two from the, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers, three Greens, two from Pauline Hanson's party, one Christian Democrat. You can argue that it's good for democracy to give smallish party like that, a decent sort of chance at a, in a system which is not actually rigged against them. Mm. I mean, the Senate system is completely rigged and the New South Wales Leaders Council system can be justified. So I think you could justify electing 12 senators um, on the same day as the House of Representatives in a fixed term, unlike the 1988 proposal. You could justify that. Um, and uh, if you want to increase the size of the Senate, you could have 13 and then have more in the House of Representatives. Or you could have 14 and have more in the House of Representatives. You could have 15. That's, uh, that, that would be the issue completely of the justifiable electorally. Representatives is Sorry? The issue of the number of representatives is a bit beyond our scope, what we're looking at today. OK, so. well, look, I'm just raising it with you. All yeah. I'm saying is that is the only way of fixing the Senate system that I would even contemplate. I, I, it's worth discussing, which is why I've discussed it in this article. Um, the idea of having eight-year terms is completely out of the question. All right. The public would never buy it. Would never buy it. And yet they did. They have in the in the in the states. Sorry. I said, and yet they have in some of the states. The parliaments have done it. The parliaments did not need the approval of the people. Um, Professor Williams. Yeah, I, I do think that the staggered or half Senate elections are an important design feature. Um, I think you know, the frame has showed some wisdom in seeing that there's some a reason not to turn over both houses each time. 
that uh, building a lag into the system can be wise for a house of review. And there are certainly arguments about whether that should be retained with an increased length. But I come to the fixed four-year term debate with a view that it should not be a debate to more broadly open up the role of the Senate or to seek larger structural changes. I think it would be wise as a matter of referendum politics, if nothing else, to bring the change in without seeking to disturb existing practices or design features, and indeed to seek to preserve them. And if we look at the referendum record in the past, it's very clear that if you are seen to be tampering with the special role of the Senate, you can run into real electoral difficulties, particularly in smaller states as well, which do see the Senate as a vital means of preserving their role in the Federation, true or not. It's often portrayed that way in referendums. And so I would say I would go to eight years because I think that is most consistent with current design features and practices. What's your, um, what's your view about the, the, uh, the acceptability to the man, on, the man and woman on the street on extending senators' terms to eight years? Yeah, and it's, that, that's a hard sell, I think. Um, but then again, of course, uh, we're extending the term to four years in the lower house, so there is an extension there. I think in both cases it's got to be clear that there is a quid pro quo and that in return there will be fixed elections. And I think that the community will not want to see parliamentarians merely extending their terms without providing greater certainty and uh, also the other benefits that come with, I think, the potential for better governance. Uh, and I think this is a hard choice. I mean, you've got the number of it one way or the other. It's simply I would fall on the side of the longer terms, recognising the need to explain that, because I think the shorter terms will actually be even harder to sell, because it will be seen as an attack on the role of the Senate and will be seen as running counter to a key design feature that was put there, including to preserve the interests of the smaller states. Can I ask? Yes, absolutely. Um, what would you say to the argument or the concern um, that probably wasn't foreseen by the Founding Fathers, that if you had eight-year terms, um, you could have someone elected and within 12 or 18 months elected as part of a party, no longer part of that party, and then is sitting in that Senate um, for another six or seven years, um, arguably um, not there because they've been voted in individually, but because they've been voted in by a party that they're no longer a part of. Well, and in some cases, the original person may have been struck out under Section 44. Their replacement wasn't even voted in the first place. They then renege, and of course, we had that on a few occasions in the last parliament. So we've had people without any apparent mandate, um, you know, changing parties. And But I think that's a larger structural issue. I think clearly it's a problem for six years, but it's equally a problem for eight years. And it's separately why I've said there should be a conversation about whether the Senate really is a, a party house. And if someone actually removes their party allegiance, should they actually be resigning their seat as a result, but I'd be keeping that entirely separate. It's not something we can fix through this. It's exacerbated mm. by the increased length. I accept that, but there's nothing we can do about this in the current debate. Mm. I think the, the, the way that we deal with that issue is probably more driven by the parties themselves and how they address that rather than any sort of formal uh, constitutional changes, but that's just my view on Although that. Although that might be easier for the bigger parties than the smaller parties that we have seen people leaving. Mm. But Clive Palmer had, uh, in his yeah. in his case, all of his candidates were required to sign a contract that if he left the party, they he would enforce the repayment of all the electoral costs. So that was an attempt by a smaller how party. <laughs> Enforceable, perhaps not, how but it shows that, that it's a live issue after <laughs> the loss of candidates in the Senate on a prior occasion. Mm. Uh, Professor Saunders. Yeah, um, can I come back to two points that you made uh, in putting these questions to us? One, you said, would there be unintended consequences from these changes? Um, and if we were to move to four-year Senate terms, the two potential unintended consequences are one, removing the rotation nature of the Senate and therefore the continuity of the Senate, and two, removing longer terms which might attract different sorts of people uh, into politics. Now, whether those, those two things have a substantive effect in the parliament at the moment is something you can probably judge better than, better than we can. But in principle, they're both quite attractive features. Uh, and so to come back to your unintended consequences question, those are two issues that might be expected to generate unintended consequences. Um, the other point is that the rotation of the Senate is one of the things that differentiates the composition of the Senate from the House. Uh, 
Now, of course, there are other things that differentiate the composition of the Senate from the House, the electoral system, uh, the, the equal representation of the state. So the House is never going to be a carbon, uh, Senate's never going to be a carbon copy uh, of the House, but removing the rotation will bring it closer. Um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is something, again, the committee might think about, but certainly you don't, I think, no one wants uh, an upper house that absolutely replicates the lower house because what's the point of having one? Um, uh, and so I think that's another sort of indirect unintended consequence that you might take into account. Yes, Professor Toomey. Uh, yes, just adding on to that uh, about the unintended consequences, there are two more to consider. The first is that under the current electoral system, you would have um, a much uh, lower quota to be elected. So the membership of the Senate would change. It would be similar to having a double dissolution every time. Uh, and that means you get far more small parties um, and um, independents, uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, up to people to decide. But nonetheless, that would be the consequence unless you change the electoral system. The other is Section 57 of the Constitution and double dissolutions. Uh, if you had a four-year term for the Senate, then the whole point of the double dissolution would disappear. And so you'd have to ask yourself, well, what, how does the double dissolution then fit into the notion of mixed-term parliaments? You'd, you'd have to build that into one of the circumstances which you could have an early election um, if there is blockage of particular bills, maybe. But the thing about double dissolutions at the moment, the practical uh, disincentive towards double dissolution is the fact that the quota is lower, so you will get in your Senate people who are not representatives of major parties. So any government uh, contemplating a double dissolution has to take into account that the consequence of that will probably be a reduction in their own representation or as a major party in the Senate and the difficulty of dealing with the Senate with a large number of crossbenchers. That disincentive in relation to a double dissolution would, of course, appear uh, if every time the Senate was elected that happened anyway. Uh, so you'd need to sort of think through uh, the relationship between the double dissolution type of procedure for circumstances where bills are being blocked house and how that plays in, in relation to um, a, a fixed term when you've taken out the various disincentives that currently exist. You would still need to keep the mechanism of a double dissolution election for obvious reasons, but... Um well, it would just be a normal election, but it would just be an early normal election. Well, that's right. It, it, you, you, you would have a provision to um, uh, break a deadlock in the, the, the passage of a bill. So, um, and that would then just mean, as you say, an early election. But you would still need to have that trigger. The, yes. The, the difference would be that there's no, as you say, there's no disincentive to the government because they're That's dealing right. with that all the time. Yes, um, you, you would probably still need to do it. If you look at the various states, some of them do have provisions for that and some of them don't. Mm. Uh, but the ones that don't have provisions in that regard are usually ones that have some other mechanism of dealing with deadlocks. So, for example, um, holding a referendum on a deadlocked bill or a joint sitting or something of that kind. So that's the other possibility. You could have some other alternative mechanism for dealing with deadlocks in relation to bills, but that's, again, taking you into broad realms of um, constitutional reform, which you might not want to be um, trespassing in. But it would, of course, be a consideration. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ramsey. Yeah, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, one is just to comment to something that Peter said a little while ago about um, the fact that we could have an eight-year term where a senator could, could uh, abandon allegiance to a party quite early on in the, in the case. I, I mean, I, I, I can't put myself in the, in the Founding Fathers' shoes and in that room, but my guess is that it was never envisaged that the parties would play such a role in the Senate. Right. The, the, it, the Senate, in my right. mind, was devised to represent state rights. Mm. And if the, if the, if the right. Founding Fathers thought anything, they probably thought that the people would be rolling turning up in their state contingencies rather than party contingencies. So uh, it's what it's evolved into. But uh, Anne, I, I want to come back to you uh, where 
Um, you, you, you spoke about, uh, we, we talked about what WA and Victoria have four year terms for their legislative councils. Mm. Yep. Um, but I think they are the only jurisdictions that have actual electorates allocated. Uh, yeah, for correct. their upper houses rather than uh, representing the whole state. That's and maybe correct. I'm wrong there, but... Yes. Uh, uh, and if that's the case, is that a different dynamic? I, I mean, is, is there something we should read into that? Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, it does depend on how you comprise your upper house. And so the question then is, well, what's your upper house supposed to be representing? So in some jurisdictions, it's supposed to be representing regions. And so you have um, people elected to represent particular regions, uh, whereas in other states like New South Wales, it's not representing the regions per se, um, but because of the electoral system and the very low quota, it's representing um, smaller um, areas of uh, support for political parties, so independents, small parties, etc. You've got a wider variety of people in your upper house. Um, so it does depend on what your upper house is perceived to be representing. So does that give us any indication on what, you know, if we're talking about an eight-year term for the Senate, does that give us any indication on what we should do or shouldn't do there? Or, or does that say, um, or, or is it saying that if, if, if you're going to have four-year terms, uh, you need to look at some, some other arrangements within, as they've done in those two, two jurisdictions? Uh, well, I think that's again sending you into broader directions of constitutional reform. So I think, for example, Barnaby Joyce was arguing that senators should be um, chosen on a regional basis rather than, um, uh, you know, as, a, as representing an entire state. So that would be the comparison between, the, say, the Victorian system as opposed to the New South Wales system. Mm. Uh, but again, that's, that's a big kind of reform, I think, than, than what you're trying to deal with more narrowly here. Mm. Professor Appleby. Uh, could I just uh, pick up on the point that uh, Professor Toomey was making and also um, Professor Saunders uh, a moment ago um, around uh, the, the, the broader conversation about the, the role of the, the Senate um, and uh, the perhaps unintended consequences of a change to uh, four-year terms. Because um, I think one of the now, even though it may not have been the intention of the Founding Fathers, but one of the very well-established um, roles of the Senate is, is this House of Review and the accountability function of the Senate, particularly the role of the estimates um, committees uh, across the course of the year. Um, and if uh, I think it would be uh, uh, both a, a publicly a hard sell, so politically a hard sell, but also um, a, 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 at a principled level a very um, uh, concerning development if um, questions around Continuity, so uh, individual senators who have um, long experience in the Senate and the, and the staggering of the terms providing that continuity in the House of Review function, the accountability function, it's quite a technical um, and highly um, uh, uh, detailed role that the, the Senate committees uh, perform. Um, the different experiences um, uh, uh, of senators, the different types of people that are attracted that uh, Professor Saunders mentioned a, a, a moment ago, uh, but also that the length of term also allows that experience to build up um, uh, during uh, the term of the, the senators. So I just think that um, if a conversation were to be had around four-year terms, these types of questions would be raised, and then you'd have to have a very serious conversation, and a hard one with the public, about the Senate's House of Review function and how you wouldn't be undermining that. Can I just come in on that and say I completely agree with what Gabrielle has just said. Um, it's not just estimates, it's at some of those other standing committees mm. of the Senate, including regs and ordinances. Mm. Yes. So if you think about that, it's got a long history going back to the 1930s um, and uh, has confronted the, the challenge of de developing a culture where you perform a genuinely useful accountability role in a way that's capable of spanning the party divide. And I think that the, the continuity of the Senate has to some extent helped to build that culture up. So again, I think that would just be another factor for you to, to put on the table and think about. I'm afraid I'm against one. I'm afraid I'm an odd man out yet again. To me, the idea of having elections, every election for 12 senators, 13 senators, 14 or 15, is an intended consequence. It's the only thing that attracts me to the idea of having a fixed four-year term of parliament. I can't think of any other argument in its favour, other than the fact that my colleagues have presented various arguments. All I can tell you is this, 
Steve Brax is one of my heroes, in fact, my major hero in this, and I had a recent conversation with him in which he told me that in devising the Victorian system, the greatest opposition he had was this argument about you have to have rotation of members. And he simply dismissed all these arguments as being old-fashioned nonsense. In these days of party machine appointments, which is what we have, the senators are not directly chosen by the people. They are appointed by party machines. We have a voting system in which voters are encouraged to think the purpose of your vote is to distribute numbers of party machine appointments between parties on a PR basis. It's actually rigged against the small parties. The only thing that's not rigged is there are occasional double dissolutions. Now, to me, it is completely obvious that the public might accept the idea that you have more diversity in the Senate which is what you'd get if you have every electionist for 12 or 13 or 14 or whatever, um, you would get all sorts of minor parties. And purely by way of example, I've had recent correspondence with the only animal justice party member of the Victorian Legislative Council. Well, he is an example of what I'm driving at. He thinks it's pretty outrageous that he had to game the system so comprehensively to get in as one of five members for a region. Because in New South Wales, the Animal Justice Party can get one out of 21 reasonably easily. Well, surely we, we ought to make the parliaments more representative, shouldn't we? By having a genuinely proportional representation system without being rigged. So therefore, I, as far as I'm concerned, I take seriously the possibility discussed by Crispin Hull in this article I refer to, uh, and I think the whole argument for rotation is ridiculous, old-fashioned nonsense argument based upon an assumption that the Founding Fathers, they had the assumption that senators would be directly chosen by the people. But that's not the fact at the moment. Senators are not directly chosen by the people, they are appointed by party machines, and of course, we changed the constitution in 1977 explicitly to make casual vacancies filled by party machine appointment. But then we've had this voting system where we have this pretense that senators are directly chosen by the people. And I, to me, it's not an unintended consequence at all. It's deliberate. To the extent that I was in favour of any change at all, I would, I would simply say it's got to be by reducing the term of senators to four years and having a generous proportional representation system as distinct from the present mean-spirited, disgraceful blot on Australian democracy, which is what we have at the moment. So I mean, I'm not sure that I really need to engage in any more conversation. Do I? I've made my position quite clear. I, I, say, I think it's, a, I it's, a it's abundantly clear. <laughs> intended change to make the Senate more representative of public opinion. So, so what this discussion, if I could chair, um, illuminates, whether we like it or not, of course, is that looking at change in the House of Representatives doesn't have to, but inevitably is likely to lead to the conversation about what is the role of the Senate. And I mean, I agree um, with Rowan. I think we were in effect making the same point in that, you know, what is the role of the Senate and was it intended to be a House of Review? Was it intended to be people state representing role. their states? Um, um, but by and large, I haven't done a poll on this, um, but I would expect that most people who are now voting, particularly above the line, are voting for a particular political party in the Senate. Hence my question about when people um, drop out of their parties. So. Uh, it, it, it is difficult to say, should there be rotation or should there not, isn't it, without grappling with that much larger question, which we might have to have another inquiry about, uh, which is actually what is, what is the role of the Senate now, as opposed to what was it intended to be 120 years ago? And that leads to a, a, another question, doesn't it, that um, in the House, the Social Policy and Legal Affairs Committee is the committee that uh, looks at constitutional issues. Mm. And in the Senate, the, there's the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, but there is no joint standing committee which addresses constitutional issues. Mm. So um, it would seem odd that, that we would be addressing as a House committee the role of the Senate. Mm. Perhaps that's Professor that's Williams, true. one of his suggestions about a parliamentary review. Um, there could be a, 
both houses looking at it together. A a absolutely. And I think that that's uh, one of the take homes for, for, for me from this discussion uh, so far. <laughs> um, look, there, we, we could spend all day talking about um, the issue of the role of the Senate. Um, I would have a different view to uh, Mr McCarris uh, in relation to um, the issue of um, if we brought the terms down to four years, then that would lower the quota to 7.1%. That would be a good um, thing. Well, I, I would debate that um, because um, you might say that that opens up the, the field to uh, all the miners and independents. Um, others might say, Mr McCarris, that um, you then get a situation where you have single interest groups um, who can hold uh, 25 million people to ransom over a particular single interest issue. So I, I don't think that's terribly democratic. But you and I can agree to disagree I'm on that. I'm going to agree to disagree on this subject. We, I just won't have a bar. <laughs> as far as I'm saying, if, if you have proportional representation, you either do it decently, and there's a, two ways of doing it decently. You can have the hair clerk system, as we have in one state and one territory, or you can have a decent proportional representation system, which we have in New South Wales. Mm. Either of those is defensible. What is not defensible is the current Senate system, whereby party machine appointments will effectively account for, what, 72 out of 76 senators, in effect, but rigging it against the smaller parties, rigging it to make quite sure that the Animal Justice Party can't get anybody elected, and so forth and so forth. I mean, if you're going to have proportional representation, do it decently. And there are two ways to do it decently. And the current situation is not one of those two ways. All right, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Professor Toomey, did you want to say anything on that in regards to that? Or um, oh, I'll well, just make the observation that the High Court seemed to disagree with Mr McKerris um, when it did address the issue as to whether the Senate was directly chosen by the people. Yeah. and. Um, Mr. McCarris's arguments were run, run um, in the case brought by uh, yeah. Bob Day in relation to a challenge to the Senate electoral system. Yeah, uh, High Court took quite a different view. Well, the point about it is that the High Court in 1984, <laughs> Chief Justice Sir Harry Gibbs, who was the sole judge, was faced with a situation of striking down the legislation struck by the Parliament, which is what he really should have done. But now that would have meant cancelling next Saturday's election in Queensland because Cyril John Mackenzie asked for it. Now, it's quite understandable that in that circumstance, somebody like Sir Harry Gibbs deserves a bit of sympathy for saying, in effect, I know perfectly well the system is unconstitutional. I'm not willing to strike down next Saturday's election because one ungrip candidate asked me for. But all it illustrates is the fact that the High Court very often constitutionalises the patently unconstitutional. And once it has done that, that becomes a precedent. Ooh. And that is why Ooh. Anne and George won that case and I lost, because of the precedent established by that three pages of bullshit legalese <laughs> handed down by Sir Harry Gibbs in November 20, 1984. Uh, it doesn't alter my arguments. All it tells me is what I already know. We all know. All right. We, the High we, Court often constitutionalises the patent. Mr McCarris, we're going to move on. <laughs> yeah. um, there's some specific questions that have been raised by uh, a, a, uh, a constituent, uh, Mark Phillips, who's asked a number of mechanical questions. Um, and you might want to just jot these down. And um, So the first one is, when would the date of an election be? Assumedly, we're talking about under a fixed term uh, process. Um, would that be set as a first Saturday of July, for example? Um, what would be the period of caretaker government prior to election? Will there be a half, so will there be a, oh, I think we've addressed that question. Um, the question was, whether, will there be a full or half Senate election every four years? That would depend on, well, we've dealt with that one. Um, when would roles and nominations close? So very specific questions. And I don't 
intend to take too long on those. But well, my answer would be the last Saturday in November, every four years, other than when there's a Victorian state election. So the Victorians would have state elections last Saturday in November of this year, and then the federal would be one year separated from that. And otherwise, just follow all the provisions of the Victorian legislation in right. relation to all those other questions. That's the answer I'd give. Thank you. I. Uh in, in working out the date of the election, clearly you'd be looking at what was the appropriate time for the Commonwealth. Malcolm says it's mm. usually in the last three months of the year, so mm. that's uh, mm. uh, that would be the likely pick. But clearly you would need to look at the existing uh, state provisions. They've all got different fixed dates mm -hmm. uh, and you'd need to dodge those um, uh, so that you wouldn't have to postpone the state yeah, election right, right. Um, in order to accommodate the Commonwealth one, but that yeah. must be easy enough. And all the rest is, is more or less um, status quo, I think. I mean, the caretaker conventions would cut in when the parliament was dissolved in the ordinary way, I think. And the, uh, the arrangements for roles and nominations clearly could also be the same as they are at the moment. As far as I can see. I agree. I mean, you, the easiest course is to be, do exactly that, let the electoral legislation do its job as it does now. I mean, you could, if you like, fix the election period by removing the discretion of the Prime Minister as to how long the election should be, because of course mm. there's a discretion there at the moment, but I can't see a compelling case for doing that. I can't see why you would put that in the Constitution. I think you'd say that's the date and you'd leave Parliament itself to resolve all of those matters. And either leave the discretion as there is now, or it could legislate, but change it down the track if it wanted. Mm. I just um, uh, add into the mix of technical questions to be considered um, is uh, if there were um, uh, exceptions built into a fixed term uh, proposal, as we've discussed at length what those exceptions might be, for example, around a vote of no confidence um, or in relation to um, uh, a deadlock, um, that would also uh, raise questions around when the election is to be held, the fixed term election. Um, would the, if there were sort of a, an extraordinary election held, would that then be for a full fixed four year terms, which would then change the date of the election, or would it be just running out the previous fixed four year terms? So there's another technical question that arises around setting the date of the election. If you also have this exceptional circumstance, you can still call an election in the case of a vote of no confidence, for instance, which would be an election called not necessarily on the fixed date that has been set. So are you saying, uh, Professor Appleby, that if we set the date as the third, no third Saturday in November, um, an early election is called because of extraordinary circumstances, then you might get a situation where um, the, the, the next parliament might serve five years rather than or three. four. Or three, or, or, three or two and a half, depending on how much of the uh, previous fixed term there was to run. Mm. Um, because mm. the alternative would, would be uh, to have mm. a four-year fixed term start from that date, which would then be a different date, yes. depending on when those extraordinary circumstances uh, were, were called. So that's a, another question that would feed into this question of, of fixing the date. I mean, Anne may know the detail, but my impression from the state constitutions, Anne, was that they all try to, to return it to normal, mm. the normal fixed term uh, as soon as mm. possible. So there's, mm. the, 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 the date remains constant. Mm. Uh, there will be some variability in the length of the term, but uh, the, the aim of all of those provisions is to, is to normalise it quickly. Yeah, th there are plenty of examples of provisions about how to get things back into kilter, but normally they're pitched in a way that um, if you do hold the early election, you shouldn't get the benefit of an even longer term, so you end up with a term that's slightly shorter. So um, it will be whatever is three years after the previous date of whatever it is, the, the third Saturday in November, rather than four years, mm. uh, in order to get you into kilter. Uh, that would, however, potentially cause problems with what Malcolm McCarris was saying about the Victorian election, because that could then end you, you up being on a Victorian election year once you do that jiggling. So you'd have to be a bit careful about how you did that. You'd probably want to choose a Saturday that wasn't a Victorian election Saturday, potentially, if the years got out of kilter. Um, can I just add something else in there as well? Um, 
At the moment, the date for starting Senate terms is, of course, the 1st of July, the fixed mm. date. Mm. You need to think about that as well, whether you still had that. Um, I think one of the problems we have at the moment is that people are elected to the Senate in, say, September, October or November, but don't start till the 1st of July. Mm -hmm. Then they're in a complete pickle, particularly if they have to resign their job in order to be able to run for the Senate because they previously held a public service position or an office of profit under the Crown. They can't hold an office of profit under the Crown until, you know, yep. during that period until the 1st of July. And so a whole lot of <laughs> somewhat stuck with not having employment in that period of time, which is pretty unfair. Um, so if you were going to be looking at all of that, you'd either want to run your elections at a date sufficiently close to July to that problem, or just remove the whole 1st of July starting date and say that mm. the start on the same date as the House of Representatives after the election. So you need to um, look at that. Um, and Just, uh, um, Professor yep. Toomey, before you go on, would that require a constitutional amendment that to change the 1st of July? Yes. Of course. Yes. Mm. Um, so you'd have to put that in with your package. If you were doing yeah. this as a constitutional reform, you'd have to factor that in as part of the, the, the package of change. Um, and the final point there is also going back to the UK Parliament's Fixed Term Parliament Act. Uh, there, if you have an early election, it says that it's then up to the Prime Minister to advise the Governor, well, in that case the Queen, um, what the date of any election will be. Um, now that's proved to be a catastrophic flaw in the UK parliamentary legislation. It's caused a whole lot of people to vote against holding an election simply because they didn't trust the Prime Minister to choose a date either before the Brexit date or after the Brexit date or three years time or who knows when. Uh, so you'd want some kind of an automatic thing. If you, if you trigger an early election by having the vote of no confidence, et cetera, et cetera, then there should be some kind of automatic period saying, well, then the, the election has to happen within 45 days or something like that, so that no one can muck around with the dates and cause difficulty. Uh, Mr. Ramsey. Uh, yeah, th thank you for raising that. That's the question that I have been interested in is that huge delay between a November election or a September election or an August election yeah. uh, and, and the installation of the new Senate. Uh, should we move to four-year parliamentary terms that were not fixed? Um, earlier on, somebody suggested that perhaps, and I think it was probably you, um, um, Anne, um, suggested that uh, the Senate should be for two, each senator be elected for two terms of the House of Representatives, uh, and I, I've got, you know, without looking at every every problem that might arise from that, I've got some sympathy for the view. Um, how would you see that? Do you see that being a, a, a serious detriment to our political system, or do you think it would be a bonus? Uh, well, with all these things, I don't actually have a strong view either way on any of them. Um, uh, certainly, um, there's some. Um, if you didn't, if you decided you weren't having fixed terms and so there was some degree of flexibility in the terms, then running the Senate terms simultaneously with mm. the House of Reps terms has a lot of benefit to it. Gets rid of the whole problem of um, the half-term elections getting out of kilter with the mm. House of Reps elections. Um, having said that, they tried on a number of occasions with referenda to get simultaneous elections and the, for various reasons those referenda failed. For good um, reasons. So, um, you'd have to be a bit, depends on what sort of a package you're putting forward, but um, that would certainly be one way of doing it if you decided to not go down the fixed route, uh, would be to make sure that the half Senate elections run uh, with every um, full House election and that the term of the Senate is just two terms of the House of Reps. It also adds a little bit of accountability to the Senate. Because one of the problems we have at the moment is the Senate can effectively force the reps to election with no consequence for itself, mm. unless there's a double dissolution election. But in this circumstance, if you're forcing the reps to an early election, well, it cuts your own term as well. Um, uh, so that because you've only got a term of two House of Reps mm. elections. So there's a bit more accountability aspect to it there as well. For a contrary view, Mr. McCarris, what do you think about changing the date on which a, a Senate term starts beyond the 1st of, of July? I think the Commonwealth should copy Victoria and have fixed four-year terms for every member of the Parliament 
but get the year of it out of, not the year of Victoria. And by the way, it would also be desirable not to make it the Queensland year either. I mean, next year there's going to be a late October Queensland election in October, so I would try and make it a year that's not Queensland, not Victoria, so you then keep the elections for the state out of... Uh, that's, where, that's why I think the present provision is so thoroughly desirable. The Prime Minister can, can get the federal election out of the way of a state election. So that's what I would do. I would have exactly as Victoria has. By the way, there's one trivial point I would make. Western Australia, in order to avoid a referendum, has kept a peculiar provision whereby the election is fixed for March but the Legislative Council members don't take their seats until the 21st of May of that year because of this peculiarity. But in Victoria, every member of Parliament is elected on the last Saturday in November each four years, and they all serve exactly the same term. And the only difference is uh, there is this peculiar proportional representation system for the upper house, and this is normal for the lower house. Um, so that's my answer. All right, thank you. And can um, I just come in on this? I, I just can't see there's any utility left in requiring the senators to wait such a long period to take their seat. Well, uh, right. it's one of those things I think we can easily dispose of and simply say at the point of election you take your seat. Mm -hmm. right. I think it's the ordinary course of things and okay. it's just one of those quirks that Ooh. it's unlike, say, mm. double terms for the senate or anything. That There's a constitutional yeah. design reason for that. I can't see any utility in maintaining mm. that aspect. Are there any other uh, unintended consequences to, um, to extend to four-year terms, fixed or otherwise? I think we've canvassed a lot. I think we've canvassed a lot. So it's money, less elections. I, before we go into, um, I don't think we've got any other Twitter questions to ask. Um, before, while we've got uh, five, uh, well, one political commentator uh, and, and five, co four constitutional experts, um, I, I'd like to explore a little bit more just briefly your suggestion, uh, Professor Williams, about um, how you, the panel might see the merits or otherwise in, in holding more of these discussions that you touched on in your first opening statement um, and, and how that might best be done from a mechanical perspective. I'm, I'm keen to just use a few minutes to, to pull that apart. Well, if I could start with a couple of things. I think uh, certainly in terms of inquiries run by this committee, it would be excellent to see an inquiry into the referendum machinery legislation. That, that's an urgent and necessary thing and I think a piece of work that is very much in the interest of the community, it needs to be done in a bipartisan way. So I think that's an immediate thing to do. But in terms of how this committee might proceed, I think uh, for these future roundtables, and I, I think they're a good idea, I mean, one option would be to allow the community to generate ideas as to what the focus might be. You may actually find the community doesn't see fixed four-year terms as being the driving passion. Perhaps they'd like to put something else on the table. It'd be good to see Parliament being responsive in that way. And it might be an opportunity to canvas a range of issues uh, rather than just one. And as I also said, I think uh, things are at a very low ebb in terms of the conversation generally, and I think we need to break out of that. And one obvious way would be that Joint Select Committee, um, as this Parliament did in 1959, um, that looked at these issues more holistically, but again with very high levels of community input. It's either that or we need a separate inquiry process, as occurred in 1988 with the Constitutional Commission. But I think that will provide a vehicle for education, public engagement, to advise Parliament on the community's views and to provide a, a mechanism for those views to be delivered, because at the moment that simply doesn't happen. Wouldn't that be better off as a joint standing committee rather than a joint select committee? Well, yes, it could be, and uh, certainly, yes, you could have a joint standing committee, but um, look, I think either way, I mean, I, I do see the merit in a standing committee because these are obviously ongoing issues that need to be resolved, and I think one of the problems is there's no regular way of engaging with these matters. And indeed, even as this uh, process shows, I mean, you really need senators in the room to be putting the perspective on these matters, mm. um, because so often their perspective actually does affect the, the, the design and indeed the possibilities for success. 
Does anybody else want to add to that? Professor Saunders? Yeah, can I say something about uh, each of the points that George has just made? So I completely agree about the referendum machinery um, framework. Uh, and to go back to a discussion that we've had in another context this morning, uh, that machinery was designed at a very different age uh, when there were different modes of communication, less social media, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and I think that uh, that change in itself justifies revisiting uh, that legislation, which um, could otherwise be quite a controversial thing to do. It's, some, it's sometimes been an issue that's been quite divisive in the parliament, but I do think it's essential in order to really help people understand uh, the purposes of questions on which they are required to vote. On the matter of um, commun the community generating ideas for change, I think that's really important. I think that one of the problems with the way in which constitutional change has worked at the Commonwealth level in the past has been too top down. Uh, and the filter through the Commonwealth Parliament has been too much just a party political issue. Uh, and the voters perceive it that way and vote accordingly. I think to somehow work out a way of generating a bit of community interest in these, um, in these questions uh, and trying to work out what voters are actually interested in um, would be very good. And I agree that you may well find that they're not interested in a whole lot of things that, uh, mm. uh, that some of the rest of us uh, might expect them to be. On the question of what the institutional mechanism should be, I mean, George is right that we have had every 30 years or so a regular complete review of the Constitution, none of which have come to anything. Mm, that was um, they've been quite different and they've produced effectively nothing, including nothing by way of much public interest, frankly. The institutional mechanism that in the end produced the most results in terms of actual constitutional change was the Australian Constitutional Convention that brought together delegations of the, um, of the, from the Commonwealth and each of the states. Uh, which sort of mixed up the, the sorts of issues that were discussed a little bit more uh, and did lead to three constitutional changes in 1977. Now, I'm not sure that that's cause and effect, but that, that is just the reality. So if you were to think of an institutional mechanism, I mean, of course, a joint standing committee of the parliament on the constitution is probably a good idea in its own right, but it needs to be a mechanism that can actually engage with people. Mm. Uh, and not just be talking heads talking down to them uh, and trying to persuade them to vote for things that, that you want to vote for uh, at the Commonwealth level. Uh, now, there's plenty of experience around the world with generating sort of public interest at the moment, but it needs a lot of careful thought, mm. I think, before you adopt the mechanism and put it in place, because yeah. it's really important. And can yes. I say, not just for constitutional change, textual constitutional mm. change, a lot of the things that I think you'll find people are concerned about are the ways in which the Constitution is being operated rather than the text of the Constitution. Mm. So you might cast the net a bit more widely um, as well. Professor Appleby. Thank you. And I just um, add further uh, comments really in support um, of both Professor Williams and Professor Saunders. Um, I think that, as, and I sort of uh, uh, touched on it in my opening statement, that there is um, a lack of public conversation around the Constitution and uh, establishing a mechanism or an institution whereby um, that conversation is facilitated uh, is a really important way of not just increasing public education around what the Constitution is, but um, uh, increasing the idea that well, in fact, constitutional reform is achievable and not something that's absolutely exceptional and extraordinary in Australia. Um, and that's not to say that every proposal, therefore, should get up. I don't think that's 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 uh, what, what I'm implying at all. But I think that we we really struggle with the idea that um, you know we've we've had limited success in referendums in the past in Australia, and therefore um, we should be very reluctant or hesitant to talk about constitutional reform and to put constitutional reform before the Australian people. So I think another. Um, really important reason for establishing an institution that can have this conversation with regularity um, uh, and is informed by the public in the way that um, Professor Saunders was just uh, indicating um, is, is a really important um, uh, uh, something that could 
be really important that comes out of uh, this committee's uh, deliberation. Um, and I think uh, the, um, the only other point that I was going to make, and Professor Saunders has, has uh, touched upon it, is, um, I mean, Professor Williams says, you know, bring the public into these types of uh, roundtable discussions, um, uh, perhaps go out to the public and think creatively about the best way of that public engagement. Um, because I think whilst sort of inviting the public in will often bring the same people in um, who may not be experts but have a particular interest whereas actually what needs to be done is to reach out and um, uh, be asking a more general a, a, a broader um, uh, public about what it is that concerns them, what it is it they don't know um, and through a sort of civics education campaign uh, sorry a civics education program as well um, how they then uh, once informed what issues they may mm. have. Because mm. I think that going out to the public right now, the general public is saying, well, what constitutional reform should we think about? Yeah. They're, they're, they haven't got the, the foundational education there necessarily no. to be able to say, well, actually, I think Section 57 really needs to be rethought. Um, that, that also should be part of the remit of any institution. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Anybody else on that issue? Can Before I make one observation? The 1929 Royal Commission into the Constitution was a more valuable document than my colleagues have suggested because in 1919, when they introduced preferential voting for the House Representative, they should have introduced the single transferable vote proportional representation system for the Senate. That's what they should have done. Now, 10 years later, the Royal Commission on the Constitution said that, and 20 years after that, the Chifley government was able to justify its correct decision of 1949 by referring to that constitutional um, reform royal commission in 1929. So that was quite a useful ex exercise because as far as I'm concerned, the only change to the Senate voting system that has improved the system was the change made in 1948, which became effective in 1949, whereby we now have a situation not envisaged by the Founding Fathers, that there is a clear-cut difference between the House Representatives and the Senate. The difference is that the House Representatives system locks out all sorts of minor parties who can get elected into the Senate. That's the difference between the two. That is the consequence of the idea of proportional representation begun in 1949, which was recommended by the Royal Commission in 1929. All right, thank you. Professor Toomey. Yes, just one observation, and this comes from my recent experience in the United Kingdom, talking to colleagues there about what's happened. The one good thing that we do in Australia, although we may be very frustrated at the lack of constitutional reform, the good thing we do is work out all the details first before putting them <laughs> to people in a referendum. We've seen the reverse happen in the United Kingdom. We have your referendum first, <laughs> saying, let's approve Brexit but nobody actually knows the terms of the deal. And then the parliament has to go afterwards and try and give effect to that decision. But the people don't get a vote on the actual on the detail. Yeah. And nobody actually who, were, who was voting originally for Brexit actually knew they were voting for Brexit on these terms. And I tried and explain to my colleagues in the United Kingdom, well, we, we do things in the reverse. We actually work out what the proposal is first what are all the details of it? What are the potential consequences of it? And then let people vote on it. Um, and that's a far better way of doing it. So what we're talking about here, about setting up some kind of process um, in this regard, um, is really important because it is the way of ensuring that when proposals do go to the people, people actually do know, or at least have the capacity to know what they are voting about and there has been a good period of considered um, uh, uh, detailed look at the proposal before it's actually put through a referendum. So um, uh, I think we should keep that in mind that we are actually doing something good um, in that regard and that the process of having a parliamentary committee or inquiries, whatever, is an essential part of what needs to be done before things go to a referendum. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for those slightly off topic, but I think um, very, very valuable contributions. Um, I'm now going to invite each of our witnesses to make any brief closing comments uh, on the substantive issue that we're dealing with today. And I'm going to uh, ask Professor Saunders to uh, kick us off because she has to go and catch up playing. <laughs>
I do, Professor but, Saunders. Uh, I think uh, uh, we've canvassed everything pretty well. Right. Um, unless you have any remaining questions, um, I don't think I've got anything to to add uh, to what I've already said, uh, except perhaps to to reiterate that I see uh, the whole question of the the term of the extending the term of the House of Representatives as part of a package, part of the way in which representative democracy works in Australia, particularly at the Commonwealth level. A very powerful level of government, somewhat more removed from the centres of population than the rest of the country. Um, and that I think in working through these sort of various options, the committee needs to think quite broadly about um, what the consequences would be of moving, removing this one check in the system of political accountability and how it might be compensated mm. for. So thank you. Thank you. Sure. And I think, uh, I mean, this debate, I think, is emblematic of just where we are generally in this area, that we have so many things that we talk a lot about. And my fear is we'll have another round table about Ooh. this in a couple of years. And <laughs> we'll have exactly the same arguments, because, in fact, I think, I think this is the third or fourth time I've done something like this with different forums on exactly this subject mm. over the last 20 years. And, of course, there are many topics like this. We can think of Section 44, for example. We've still got that in our constitution. Uh, this parliament has identified that around 60% of the Australian community are disqualified from running for this federal parliament. I mean, that surely should be something we engage with. And of course, there's a very long list beyond that. But if we come back to fixed terms, we got to the point in the last parliament where the opposition leader and the prime minister both said we needed to do this. We have clear bipartisan support. It's in the platforms of Australia's major parties. That's right. um, the business community and others are behind it. It's been done in every state, including with referendums in some cases. Um, but we seem unable to actually move beyond that platform to actually get it done. And I think that really reveals some really quite deep systemic weaknesses in our governance structure that we can't just get something done and we can't hold any referendum on anything for 20 years, unlike every other parliament we have prior to that that did it very regularly. So that's why, again, I keep coming back to process. Um, that's costing us dearly in this area, that even with something like this, it's been a good discussion. But I'd be particularly interested to read whatever comes from this committee, what are the steps that parliament can now take Ooh. in light of those things to actually deliver an outcome? I'd like to move beyond talk into actually giving the people a say. Very good. Thank you. Professor Williams. Uh, Professor Appleby. Thank you. Um, and uh, similarly, I won't uh, rehash the uh, many points that we've covered in the last uh, couple of hours. Um, I think I would just uh, reinforce um, this idea that uh, there are a number, a number of consequences of moving to uh, uh, four-year terms or fixed four-year terms, and they're not only constitutional consequences. They're not only considering, for example, what would happen in relation to Senate terms or in relation to the deadlock provisions. Uh, there are potential uh, consequences around accountability, and responses to that may not necessarily be constitutional responses, but they may be legislative reform responses. And um, we've spoken about uh, the idea of a package of reforms to address accountability concerns if we were to move to four-year uh, terms um, and uh, issues around um, the functioning of question time, engagement of citizens, the use of petitions, and I just add to that um, the, uh, the, the importance of the um, inquiry and community engagement functions of some of our independent statutory bodies, such as the Human Rights Commissions or the Ombudsman. These are all um, other ways in which accountability can happen. And if uh, there's a genuine consideration, uh, consideration of the accountability concern, they should be part of the package that uh, the committee um, is considering. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Appleby. Uh, Professor McCarris. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr McCarris. OK, well, as you've probably gathered, I'm an electoral reformer, which should be done by ordinary legislation of parliaments. I'm strongly in favour of decent electoral systems being given to the Australian people. I am not a member of the Australian Constitution Change for Changes Take Brigade. I'm not a member of that brigade. I would vote yes for the repeal of Section 44 of the Constitution. I would vote yes to recognise Aboriginal Australia provided the proposal enjoyed the enthusiastic support of the Aboriginal leadership. I would vote yes for that. I can't think of anything else I'd vote yes for. I've always been dead against so-called simultaneous elections proposals, and I think it's a very good thing that the Australian people have now rejected that idea four times, I might add. 
Um, so far as the fixed four-year term of Parliament is concerned, well, I think I've made my position clear. I think the intended consequences of that are what I'm talking about. We, the way we should do proportional representation in this country is we should either do it the Hare Clark way, which is the desirable way to do it, really, or alternatively, we should do it the way the Legislative Council of New South Wales operates, have a, a decent, what they call, district magnitude. It's quite a, quite a largish number to be elected, so that the Senate then becomes more representative in terms of giving voices to these people like Animal Justice Party and so forth and those sort of people. Um, that would be a very good change, but I really don't favour any change at all. So I suppose all I'm doing is commenting upon changes that I don't really particularly want, actually. I'm just saying... I think you've made that very I clear, think, I think Mr. people McCarris. understand my position. By now, I think they? you've made that very clear. All right, thank you. And to close it off uh, this morning, uh, Professor Toomey. OK, the, the one thing I'd say is that if you do get to a position where you're proposing fixed term parliaments and then you have to consider, well, in what circumstances should you be able to have an early election, and then you start looking at issues about votes of no confidence, etc., um, I would have um, things to say about the particular detail of how you do that. Uh, there are some flaws in the New South Wales and Queensland legislation in that regard. There are issues about reserve powers and the governor, uh, uh, governor general, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you do get to that position, um, just come back to me and I'll give you something written that points out where the various problems are. And I'm happy to help at that stage. We might very well take you up on that. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for your attendance here today. If you've been asked to provide any additional information, which I don't believe you have, would you please forward it to the Secretary? Uh, you'll be sent a copy of the transcript of your respective evidence uh, and you'll have an opportunity to request uh, any corrections to transcription errors. Um, if there are no other issues arising, I'll now declare this round table closed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.